Yep. The regular meeting of the Board of Education of the San Francisco Unified School District for April 16th, 2024 is now called to order. Uh, roll call, please, Mr. Steele. Thank you, Vice President Alexander. Commissioner Bogus. Commissioner Fisher. Here. Commissioner Lamb. Commissioner Sanchez. Here. Commissioner Wise Ward. Here. Vice President Alexander. Here. President Matomini. Thank you. Um, this, uh, well, first I want to announce that, um, President Matamidi obviously is not here. We're sorry to report that she's out sick, but, uh, I hope, hope she'll be back soon. Um, and this evening, public comment on all items will be heard under section E public comment, which includes uh, public comment for agenda, as well as non-agenda items. A speaker card must be turned in to staff in order to speak. Um, if you are a student, please make sure you write student at the top of the speaker card. Uh, and I can should probably repeat this later, right, when people get here. Um, and child care will be provided from 6 to 9 p.m. for children ages 3 to 10. Um, so please note that as well. Um, all right. At this time, uh, before the board goes into closed session, I will call for any speakers to the closed session items listed in the agenda. There will be a total of five minutes for speakers. Uh, are there any speakers for public comment on closed session items? Here to speak, you can see the step to the podium, press the button once. So I haven't met most of you, but I'm Scott Rafferty, uh, and I represent people in uh, this city who are concerned with the election system. Uh, and I never imagined that it would devolve into just a dispute over uh, over the rule of law, really. I mean, the Brown Act issues, uh, the Public Records Act issues, and the concept of passing a resolution which claims all the benefits of a legislative process while disclaiming any intention of doing what the section requires. So I've had productive discussions with your counsel, and I think very generously gave you access to a draft complaint. And now I see it on the on the uh, closed session agenda, which must be very confusing to the public. And when the public gets confused, I I get a lot of hate mail, and I don't think that's that's fair. Uh, but what happens to me is immaterial. Uh, it's a prospective plaintiff and should not have to go through this. So uh, I, I don't I don't think you should. Uh, I think you should follow the rules. And and open government is every bit as important as uh, election uh, equality. So I'm I'm kind of at a loss to where as to where to go from here because I I really thought we could resolve this relatively amicably. So uh, Thank you very much, and I'm available to any or all of you uh, at uh, your convenience if you require any more information. Thank you very much. Thank you. Seeing no other in-person public comments. Um, thank you. Uh, please note that the board will take a roll call vote on the recommended student expulsions when we reconvene to open session. And I now recess this meeting at- Did we check for online? Oh. I am so sorry. See, I knew I was going to make mistakes. This is the first time I'm doing this. All right, let's check for online public comment. At this time, we will take online public comment uh, for uh, closed session items. I currently see four hands up. Each speaker will have uh, one minute to speak. So I see Stephen, Preston, and Steve in that order. So Stephen, go ahead, please. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to correct that real quick. We have a total of five minutes for closed session public comments. So uh, there are three minutes and eight seconds left. So um, how, however long the folks speak, if they could, you know, if they want to limit themselves so other folks can speak, but we do have a total of three minutes, three minutes, eight seconds. Okay, my apologies. We do have three minutes left um, for public comment. So uh, Stephen, go ahead, please. 
Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, the fair vote analysis of school board elections from 2016 to 2022 found meaningful levels of racially polarized voting in your recent elections. Fair vote used several different metrics and all of them confirmed the overall finding. So it'll be interesting to see what your commissioned analysis will find. The CVRA does not establish a legal threshold of racially polarized voting below which you would be guaranteed to win in court. That means there is an element of uncertainty and legal risk that your current election method could be found in violation, no matter what your study concludes. Even if you were to win in court, it will be likely be expensive to fight this lawsuit, and you would not be entitled to demand that the losing side pay your legal expenses. That's why Burbank has set aside $1 million to fight its CVRA lawsuit. For those reasons, I encourage you to open a dialogue with the CVRA attorney to discuss a compromise settlement like Albany did, allowing it to use the California Supreme Court approved method of proportional ranked choice voting. That, in my view, is your best path forward. Thank you. Thank you. Preston? Preston? Hello, my name is Preston Jordan. I am an Albany City Council member. And um, as you just heard, Albany was able to negotiate with the attorney that sent a letter to the city, which was Kevin Schenkman, um, to change to a method that maintained our elections at large, but actually improved our elections, which is proportional ranked choice. Um, you have a difficult decision in front of you, whether to just go to seven districts um, to fight at a cost of hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars and or perhaps switch to proportional rank choice with your current 4-3 citywide um, at large. And I encourage you to try to negotiate because it is possible to get there. Good luck. Thank you. And Steve. Thank you. My name is Steve Chesson. I'm president of Californians for Electoral Reform, and I'm speaking on item B3, the CVRA letter. I'm going to be brief, as you have heard from me before, and the previous speakers, two previous speakers made points that I was going to make. All I'm going to say is that you should really open a dialogue with Mr. Rafferty to discuss a settlement that uses, that uses proportional rank choice voting. Thank you very much. Thank you. That does conclude our uh, virtual public comment for the closed session items. Thank you, everyone, for your comments. Uh, and now I will recess this meeting at 5 11 p.m. And we'll be back after closed session. Nice. Oh, no, we're just talking loud. Yeah, we're not studying up here. Tonight. We're just talking loud. All right. Thank okay, you. You're not you. talking loud. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day. SFUSD will provide closed captioning and American Sign Language ASL and interpreter services throughout today's board meeting. Live transcription can be found here. HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www.streamtext.net forward slash player question mark event equals sign SFUSD dash board. Attendees who wish to provide public comment to the board and would like an ASL interpreter can use the Q&A box in the Zoom app to type their name or handle and list the item or items on the agenda they would like to comment on. The attendee will need to have a functioning camera in order to communicate with the interpreter and the board. When it is the attendee's opportunity to provide comment, the Zoom host will promote the attendee to panelists and enable the attendee's video. Translation, go ahead, please. Thank you. As if you did covering I'm sorry. SFUSD is offering interpretation services. 
in Spanish and Cantonese. Thank if you, you need interpretation, please the add the following phone number. After dialing, please introduce the phone number. This message will be repeated in Spanish and Cantonese. El Distrito Escolar Unificado de San Francisco ofrece servicios de interpretación en el idioma español. Si necesita interpretación por medio de Google Meet, por favor marque el siguiente número telefónico, seguido de la clave de acceso. 1-319-382-9676. Por favor, introduzca la clave 665-996-976, seguido de la tecla numeral. Gracias. Gracias, señor Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That does conclude our translation services. Good evening, everyone. I am reconvening um, this regular meeting of the Board of Education at 6.35 p.m. Um, as you can see, President Matamidi is not here tonight. Um, we wish her well and hope she um, is back with us soon. Um, and so I'll be chairing the meeting. And uh, in a moment, I'll read the re readout from closed session. No, let me do that first. And then I'll make a few announcements about the agenda. Um, so this is the report from our closed, sec closed session action. In the matter of student XS versus SFUSD OAH case number 2024020647, the board by a vote of six eyes, one absent, Matamidi gives the authority of the district to pay up to the stipulated amount. In the matter of student LC versus SFUSD OAH case number 2024020489, the board by a vote of six eyes, one absent, Matamidi gives the authority of the district to pay up to the stipulated amount. In the matter of student QB versus SFUSD OAH case number 2024020709, Student XS versus SFUSD. Um, sorry, there's that was uh, this one's duplicated. I apologize. Strike that last part. So, in the matter of QB versus SFUSD, OAH case number 2024020709, the board by a vote of six eyes, one absent, Matamidi gives the authority of the district to pay up to the stipulated amount. And in the matter of student AL versus SFUSD OAH case number 2024020792, the board by also a vote of six eyes, one absent, Matamidi gives the authority of the district to pay up to the stipulated amount. And in two matters of anticipated litigation, the board by a vote of six eyes, one absent, uh, Matamidi gives direction to the general counsel. Um, all right. Um, I also want to announce that we will be doing public comment under item section E, which is near the beginning of the meeting. Um, and this includes public comment for agenda and non-agenda items. Uh, a speaker card must be turned in to staff in order to speak over here. Um, if you are a student, please write student on top of your speaker card. And um, we are limiting public comment um, to some extent, so that we can start the business of our meeting by 8 p.m., because our child care only goes until 9, our student delegates oh. need to leave at 9. So um, so we'll start public comment as quickly as we can after the beginning of the meeting, but then um, we will move to other business at 8 o'clock. So we'll do um, 
like I said, the, the agenda items first, and then we'll have some time for non-agenda items, but we ask for your patience. We also ask to please uh, work with uh, Mr. Steele and staff. If there are groups coming together, we would really appreciate folks uh, consolidating their comments, maybe having just a few speakers on one topic. You can all stand up together and show us who you are, but we want to make sure we get to as many um, different topics and uh, points of view as possible in the meeting. So please um, bear with us and we ask for your understanding with that process. Um, child care, as I think folks hopefully know, will be, is available um, until nine for children ages three to 10 across the hall. Um, let's see, we did translation services. Uh, oh, uh, we do have online access. Um, it is unlikely that we'll get to online public comment because there's so many people here in person and we're prioritizing the people that did come in person to the meeting. But please be aware, you're always welcome to send us public comments by email. We read them all um, and we really appreciate that. So uh, even if you're observing online, we want to hear from you. The other thing I'll note is we do not have SFGov TV here tonight. So you're only going to get the wide angle shot. You won't get the nice close ups on us, uh, unfortunately, um, this evening. All right. Um, now I'm going to read our land acknowledgement. Um, and so hopefully we can all use this as an opportunity as we respect the indigenous stories of this land. We also can take a breath and center ourselves for the meeting. We, the San Francisco Board of Education, acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatish Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatash Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their tra traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatash community, and by affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. All right. We will now move to item two, the approval of board minutes of the regular meeting of January 9th, uh, the special workshop meeting of January 23rd, and the special meeting of January 31st, all of this year, 2024. Um, are there any, oh, well, first of all, can we get a motion and a second, please? So moved. Second. Are there any corrections, uh, colleagues? Seeing none, uh, roll call, please, Mr. Steele. Thank you, Commissioner Bogus. Oh, excuse me, Commissioner Simpson, Student Delegate Simpson? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Bogus? Yes. Commissioner Fisher? Yes. Commissioner Lamb? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Wiseman Ward? Yes. Vice President Alexander? Yes. President Matami? Six eyes. All right. Um, the other issue I'll mention around the agenda item is if you look at the agenda, agenda excuse me, you'll notice that we have a public hearing regarding educator housing, which is item I. That public hearing is the only exception to public comment where we will actually have additional public comments specifically for that item um, and the one that follows it, item J, at that time. So if you're here to speak on that item, you're welcome to um, wait until item I. You're also welcome to speak during general public comment, but the others here who are speaking on other items would certainly appreciate it if you decided to wait until item I. Um, all right, let's go to the superintendent's report. Thank you, Vice President Alexander. Um, good evening, everyone. And it's April, and we have a lot of exciting things that happen in April. Um, earlier this month, I got to go to our Career Technical Education Showcase, uh, my second year going, and this is just such a fun event. We had 35 CTE pathways from 14 schools uh, showcase what they're learning. Uh, more than 155 students participated. We had 50 plus industry partners in attendance. And see, now I'm getting the lay of the land, so I knew uh, what to expect there. I hadn't eaten beforehand, but I knew uh, that I'd be able to get some great uh, snacks from our culinary uh, programs at Marshall and at O'Connell. Um, I got to be here and see this is, uh, these are students who are actually studying the DNA of a strawberry from the biotechnology program in Galileo. And I just love being able to see how our career pathways are setting our students up to meet our goal of college and career readiness and really getting their interest in uh, entrepreneurship, in health, in science, and, and in all the different areas that they're studying. So that's a fun event. Um, we also had our Youth Summit 
Um, this is where we bring together youth leaders from all of our high schools and um, want to appreciate our um, student advisory council leaders and uh, including Lenani and Megan who helped uh, organize the event working with Mary Kate Rossi to uh, and the board office. Um, and really, it's an opportunity for students to come together and uh, learn about leadership, share their ideas. We had a very thoughtful discussion about our resource alignment initiative and what they want to see for the future for SFUSD. And I appreciated the challenging questions they asked me about how is this process going to benefit students? And so um, it was really great to spend time with them. And speaking of resource alignment, we had our um, first round of community input through a town hall, community sessions, and a survey. We received over 10,000 survey responses, so really appreciate our community that's taking the time to give us feedback uh, and share what matters to them as we determine how to organize our resources. We had about 700 people in our in-person community sessions and uh, over 650 on our town hall. Um, and then, oops, uh, pressing on my screen, not... Uh, uh, there you go. And um, we have our next round of uh, input coming at the end of the month, and we'll do another town hall on Thursday, April 25th. Then we have more in-person in community sessions. And really want to encourage you to come to those sessions. It means so much to be able to have the conversation face-to-face -face about what, what we want for the future of our students in San Francisco Unified. Um, for um, if oh, now go to the next slide. Um, also, now is the time when uh, many families already received their enrollment, um, uh, uh, where they their assignment rather for school um, for their school for the fall, and some may be wanting to uh, still submit an application in round two. So you can do that up through April nineteenth, and we do our best to make sure we're matching uh, your students and your family with the school that's going to best meet their needs. Um, as I said, a lot going on in April. We have a National Library Month, and so, um, and this is, a, uh, sorry, looking at my news here, where'd this go? Um, and so for, well, this month we celebrate our, our, there we go. We go. Um, we celebrate our library and our librarians. And as a former English teacher, the school library is one of my favorite places. Um, it's a nurturing and inviting space where students experience all things literary um, related to literacy, from reading and writing. Um, but we have so much more there as well. We got this a place where they hold book clubs. Um, we have comic book. Some of our libraries have 3D printing, and they do origami and building sets. And I love when I visit the school, seeing the different libraries that we have set up, and want to appreciate our teacher librarians for the many joys they contribute to our school communities. Um, it's also uh, this month is uh, Pride Month in San Francisco Unified. And you know our, our tradition of honoring the identities and history of the LGBTQ plus community in April represents our values as a community. And um, you know, beginning since 1990, with the exception of the LGBTQ plus student services, we've been ceaselessly working to leverage policy and practice to ensure our schools are welcoming to all. We have a lot of activities that happened this month. I'm excited this year, uh, my office, the superintendent's office is hosting a rainbow read aloud for all of our elementary schools on April 23rd. Our featured book is 47,000 Beads by Koja and Angel Adeyo, Adeyoha, uh, illustrated by Holly McGillis. And so um, we're excited that kids are going to hear directly from the author that story. And we're steadfast in our belief that our community of queer, transgender, and gender expansive students and staff enrich our schools and deserve to feel seen and safe. While our efforts are bolstered by the San Francisco Board of Education policies and California state law, these policies are only as meaningful as our collective commitment to making the policy reality. And in the words of Ola Joseph, diversity is not about how we differ. Diversity is about embracing one another's uniqueness. And um, then we'll end just with uh, one more exciting event. Uh, if you go to the next slide. In um, the city, we have our, um, this month is we showcase the arts uh, throughout the whole month. Um, we had we do this at seven different venues throughout San Francisco, and on Saturday you can go try to go to as many as possible. We also have um, interactive or, um, interactive exhibits as well as performances by our students. So last year I got to see our students perform 
at Golden Gate Park and got to see art of our students hanging in the De Young Museum. That was really special to see. I mean, what, what a great opportunity for our young artists here in San Francisco. Um, so that concludes my report, and I look forward to seeing people out and about at these different activities. Thank you, Superintendent Wayne. Do we have a student delegates report this evening? Yes, we do. Um, I'd like to congratulate the SAC on our recent youth summit. We had a lot of amazing youth leaders there. We worked very hard to put it on. And um, speaking of youth leadership, I'd like to talk about a few issues that are pressing concerns for students across SFUSD. I'm not exactly sure if I'm allowed to talk about either of these topics as technically a board member, but I'm going to because I am a student first. Though this is the student delegate report, I'd like to talk about teachers. Many of our credentialed teachers and outsourced art teachers get treated as if they don't matter and it affects students all across the district. There's a pattern of mistreatment and part of this mistreatment is low pay, lack of job security and insufficient protections. It's easy for people to write me off as speaking only about my school site, but it's a gross underestimation of student leaders dedication to this district. I have personally met with UESF. I have attended rallies and spoke with multiple board members and Superintendent Wayne on these subjects. I'm using this platform to advocate for a systemic change in how we hire, treat, and retain educators with an emphasis on art teachers across elementary, middle, and high school. Our students need teachers. Not only that, but they need teachers that feel safe in their job and at their school site while being given adequate support to be able to continue teaching us. Not all staffing troubles in the district can be blamed on a nationwide teacher shortage. There are specific things that our district is doing wrong, and I hope they continue to be addressed. Student leaders and student groups will continue to advocate for our safety and our teachers' safety, whether it's gun violence on campuses or our teachers' well-being and security. It's about time everyone started listening. On the subject of school closures, I'm aware, and many of you may be aware, that Dr. Matt Wayne is hosting multiple town halls across the city to get input from the community as well as a survey. And I'd like you to also be aware and pay attention that the community is speaking out here. They have showed up to tell you what they want and this should not be ignored in favor of those town halls or that survey. And I, I urge you to continue not only hearing, but really, really listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, student delegate Simpson, for those powerful comments. Um, all right, let's get to public comment. Um, so again, just I want to clarify the process, and, and Mr. Steele will uh, announce the order in just a minute. But we're going to do first student public comment uh, here in person. Second, agenda items, uh, comments on items that are on the agenda tonight here in person. And third, non-agenda items here in person. If there's time before eight, uh, which there may be, it sounds like maybe, hopefully, um, then we'll take some online public comments starting with students online. So that'll be kind of the, the prioritization. Um, and again, thank you everyone for your understanding. If you're watching online, the room here is packed and there's a lot of people that took the trouble to come here tonight, which is why we're prioritizing the in-person comments. Are we ready to begin? We are. And just a reminder, each speaker will have one minute. Uh, please, um, you know, respect that time so that everyone has a chance to speak. And let's also remember, because there's a lot of people here, to just, you know, respect everybody's right to speak. Um, if you want, others want to stand up with someone to be in solidarity with them, that's fine. But, you know, if we if we get really loud or other things, get it, it gets really hard to hear. So please just, like, let people have their full minute and um, and respect that and respect the process. Thank you. Great. Uh, as, pre as Vice President Alexander mentioned, we're going to be starting with students. I will call your names uh, five at a time, so please come line up. Uh, if I call your name, and then you'll have one minute each. Uh, Maya uh, Masaka, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing names. Yonatan Alvarado. Right up here at the podium. Theo. Strogalis, Kara Lee, and Sarah Muranov. Mm -hmm. So I press the button? Oh, 
Hello, my name is Maya Masadka, and I'm a current ninth grader at Galileo. I attended Bessie Carmichael FEC from kindergarten to eighth grade. This is not my first time talking about the facilities at Bessie Carmichael FEC here at the Board of Education. At both of our campuses, our HVAC system has been malfunctioning long before I started at that school, which was over 10 years ago. In some classrooms, you have no control over the system, and in others, it simply does not work. On hot days, the classrooms are hot and cold, and on cold days, it's cold in there. SFUSD also has issues with responding to our work orders in a timely manner. At our middle school campus, we had a sink in a STEM classroom that has been broken for over three years before it was fixed just recently. We had a cracked window that was left cracked for almost three years before getting it fixed. I urge you to issue this bond in order to focus on renovating schools in a timely manner, especially schools that need it the most, so that students will have a safer and happier learning experience. Thank you. I need something in Spanish. Okay. Um, la sabiduría comienza hoy. Luchemos por una mejor educación. Cuando hablamos de la uh, de una mejor educación, nos referimos al tipo de atención que recibes. Mi nombre es Jonathan. Hoy les hoy estoy aquí para contarles mi experiencia como estudiante inmigrante. He estado en los Estados Unidos durante dos años. He asistido a dos escuelas diferentes. La primera fue aproximadamente muy grande, aproximadamente 400 estudiantes. La mayoría de ellos asiáticos. Realmente ellos se sentían impotentes porque era una escuela muy grande y la atención no era la requerida. En una clase habían 30 estudiantes con tan solo un solo maestro. No recibí la atención correspondiente para el aprendizaje. Entonces me cambié y encontré la escuela John Jordan, pequeña escuela llena de conocimientos, aprendizaje y que me ayudaron sin importar, importar mis características y mis diferencias como inmigrante. Potenciaron toda mi confianza en mí mismo y continuaron moldeando mi futuro. Aunque mi inglés no es bueno, me darán la esperanza de desarrollar mis conocimientos y formar a, a mis habilidades que nunca antes había demostrado. La pequeña escuela me ha demostrado que no depende de dónde vengo, sino de dónde quiero ir. Las oportunidades de estar en la escuela Disculpe. pequeña me hacen sentir ya seguro. Es, ya es tiempo. Disculpe. Yeah. Gracias. No, no. Yeah. Te gracias. Sí, y gracias. Pues, una última cosa. Okay. Por favor, no cierren las escuelas pequeñas, porque tengo un hermano pequeño y pues estoy gracias. viendo para su futuro. Gracias. So the wisdom starts today. Let's fight for a better education. When we're talking about a better education, we are talking about the type of attention that we receive. My name is Jonathan, and I am here today to tell you my experience as a migrant student. I've been in the US for about two years and attended two different type of schools. The first was approximately uh, 400 students, very big school. Most of the kids were Asian kids. Uh, they felt uh, powerless because it was a very large school and they didn't have the attention that was required. In one class, there were 30 students with only one teacher. I didn't get the attention that was uh, corresponding for my learning. Then I switched to another school, which was John Jordan. It's a small school full of knowledge and learning. They helped me no matter how were my characteristics or my differences. As a migrant, they put into potential with all of the confidence that I had in myself, and they continue to mold my future. Even though I don't speak a lot of English or very good English, they gave me hope and I was able to get more knowledge and I was never being told by anybody else um, such a thing. So please, one last thing, do not close the small schools. Thank you. Hi, my name is Theo, and I'm a senior in the technical theater department at Ruth Asella School of the Arts. Our two beloved technical theater teachers were suddenly removed on March 18th. The removal of close mentors shows a lack of consideration for our students' safety. It has halted our learning and made our classrooms increasingly unsafe with one qualified teacher doing the work of three. While we understand the importance of confidentiality in situations like this, the lack of information only encourages people to spread rumors and misinformation, further escalating the unsafe school environment. The students have not felt represented 
represented through this process. We have not been interviewed during this investigation and were not questioned before our teacher's removal. We feel left out of this decision that directly affects us and we feel continue, we continue to feel overlooked. We speak for our community when we express our outrage. Hello, my name is Kara and I'm a student in the World Music Department at Ruth Ozawa Soda. Right now, students across our community are distraught that their performances will not be able to happen. Our World Music Performance is scheduled for May 10th and 11th, and the texts need as complex as a full-scale musical. We have been rehearsing pieces for the past nine months, which include over 70 instrumentation of Afro-Haitian, Afro-Brazilian, Japanese, and Afro-Cuban in drumming and dancing. These pieces require students, sound engineers, lighting technicians, and at least eight stage heads. Our performances sell out every show, 750 tickets, and we specifically rely on this show to fundraise to purchase our classroom needs of instruments and costumes, which are not funded by the district. Right now, we do not know whether to take our show off campus, which would cost approximately 22,000 and ask the district to cover the, those costs, or to hire professional technicians, which would cost approximately 11,000. Numerous departments have been left scrambling just like us and do not know how to proceed. Hello, my name is Sarah and I will continue to speak on behalf of the Technical Theater Department. We are here because we have had multiple meetings with school and district administrators who all claim to understand and care, yet none can articulate a plan for addressing our concerns. Now we are asking the board to intervene. Based on the events leading up to the dismissal of our two educators, it is our understanding that the current chaos is a result of the district's fear of litigation. This impulsive response to the from the district has created a culture of fear which puts lifelong educators' careers at risk and threatens student success. SFUSD should prioritize the safety of our education not the concerns of one parent. From patterns we have seen in the past and comments that have been made from the district regarding this investigation, we do not have evidence to have faith in the district that this process of removal has been and will be carried out honestly. That is why we are here at the Board of Education. I'm gonna call the next group, Fiona Hunt, Angelina Costa, Quinn O'Kelly, Alexis uh, Palaleo uh, and Gabriela Portillo. Go ahead. Um, I'm continuing off of what Sarah just said. This process has revealed to us that institutional change is needed for artists and residents to establish sustainable careers at SOTA. For them, this is not an occasional side gig at an elementary school. It is a 40 plus hour week job. The artists and residents system with little pay and zero protections does not work at SOTA, where artists and residents are fundamental to our school. Annette Ribeiro has been an artist and residence at SOTA for 15 years and is the head of the costume and fashion design department. But there is no high school costume or fashion design teaching credential available in the state of California. It should not be the burden of our teacher to suffer the conditions of an artist in residence position because the state does not recognize our unique program as a credentialed subject. It should be the responsibility of the district to protect our valuable educators. Ms. Ribeiro deserves the same protections as a tenured teacher. This situation has been a most devastating blow both to the artists in residence and CTE programs because not only was an unprotected artist in residence removed, but so was a tenured unionized teacher. Our community demands an immediate and fair resolution. The obscene lack of protections afforded to teaching artists consistently fails to attract and retain educators, especially amongst a district-wide shortage of teachers. We cannot ensure stable learning environments for students without first creating sustainable careers for our teachers. We met with our school administration yesterday for Superintendent Wayne's request and were directly told by them that they had no more information than we did and thus could not properly address our concerns. We now request to meet with Associate Superintendent of Schools, Ms. Rice Mitchell, or Executive Director of High Schools, Mr. Tony Payne. Thank you for your time. Hello, I'm Quinn O'Kelly. I'm part of the technical theater program at Ruth Saw School of the Arts. I also have dyslexia. About 10% of the population has dyslexia and 50% of the prison population. Alternative programs that I've had, uh, that I partake in, and also having mentors that are there for me every day has greatly improved my education. 
taking away these programs detracts from people like me, people with learning disabilities, and puts them at a far greater risk for slipping between the cracks. I really hope we can all help support these programs and support teachers that help offer these programs instead of taking them away. Thank you. If the board moves forward with closing and merging small schools like June Jordan in the Southeast, it risks breaking several laws and discriminating against black, low income and students with IEPs. Closing June Jordan, which serves as the largest percentage of black, low income students of color and students with disabilities in all schools in the area would violate a B1912, which prohibits discrimination based on race, disability and income. Title I requires that special education funds follow a student so closing June Jordan to avoid spending this money would not do anything to lower these costs. Closing June Jordan based on small class sizes and class and small teacher to student ratios violates AB 1912 and the small schools design policies, which require students with disabilities to be served by a smaller teacher to student ratio. Its ratios. If June Jordan is closed, SFUSD would not only lose an incredible school, but would place itself in serious legal jeopardy, which it simply cannot afford. Thank you. Hello, my name is um, my name is Gavi, and I wouldn't trade June Jordan for the world. Why? Because June Jordan isn't just a, a school. It's a safe space where I feel generally connected. One of the best things about June Jordan is its size. It's small enough that you're not just another student in class. Here you can truly connect with the staff, unlike larger schools where buildings relationship with teachers might seem impossible. June Jordan offers connections that are crucial for academic success. Feeling connected means thriving as a student without feeling the intimidation of authority figures. Personally, June Jordan has been transformative, but more than that, the connections that I've created with the teachers and my community is what have, have helped me move forward. Excelling in classes and feeling prepared for college are just some examples. As an English learner, I've received so much support here, something that I didn't find elsewhere. Elsewhere, elsewhere, or sorry. In essence, June Jordan School for Equity is not just a school. It's a stepping stone for success in its, in its nurturing environment where connections are cultivated. Thank you. I have uh, two more cards for students, Hannah Munkowitz and uh, Alan Tello or Teo. Um, you, you'll be able to go in the next section. So just hold off. I'll call you again, okay? Alan, you can go ahead. June Jordan School for Equity is more than just a school. It's a beacon of hope and opportunity for our community. Closing this institution would mean closing the doors on a transformative vision of education that prioritizes equity, empowerment, and social justice. This school is essential because it requires it represents. It represents a commitment to creating a more just society. It provides a unique space where students learn not only academic aspects, but also the essential skills needed to tackle injustice and inequality. Our community needs this school to stay open because it prioritizes a lifeline to students who have been historically disadvantaged and marginalized. As an organizer, I believe in the power of institutions like June Jordan School for Equity. It is a center where young minds are trained to become leaders and change makers. Closing such a school would be a disservice to our collective future as countless young people would be denied the opportunity to thrive in an environment that value their voices and experience experiences. Let's work together to ensure that June Jordan School for Equity remains open, not only for currently enrolled students, but also for future generations. Our community's commitment to equality and justice requires nothing less. Thank you. That's all the cards I have for students. Moving on to agenda items. Yep, great. So this is for agenda items, Supriya Ray and Scott Rafferty. You can come line up in one minute each. Good evening, everyone. My name is Supriya Ray, and I'm here to talk briefly about the CVRA and the Facilities Master Plan. With regard to the CVRA, I just wanted to thank the board for going and taking a closer look at this issue and spending the time to figure out what's the best way forward. I really appreciate that you're going to be doing a study and that you're working in cooperation with CCSF to see if there actually are 
any issues that need to be remedied with our voting system and to make sure that any changes will not adversely affect the populations that are being protected. So I just wanted to thank you for doing that. With regard to the facilities master plan and the uh, issue of an upcoming bond, I just wanted to express concern that there remains quite a uh, Unfortunately, a lack of trust among many folks in the school district and outside the school district about the district's ability to live up to its commitments. So I hope that you will work to restore that trust. Thank you. Thank you. Scott Rafferty. Scott Rafferty for public comment. That's all we have for agenda items. Moving on to non-agenda. Again, I'll be calling five up at a time, and then you can um, line up at the podium. Hannah, come up. Rafael Picasso. Mateo Fried Friedman. Uh, Mar Marty, I think it says Marty Durales. Teresa Dulalas, Zachary Frial, and Kian Church Boneta. All right. Just forgive me if I'm mispronouncing names. Okay. All right. Hi, I'm Hannah. I'm a parent and I'm here with my son, um, and so does Theater Tech. I'm a single mother, an artist, and expressive arts therapist in training. My son has ADHD and CPSD. CP CPTSD, who else is nervous? He had a particularly difficult time transitioning to his freshman year at SOTA. We knew during the school tour that theater tech was where he was meant to be. We felt safe, supported, and continued to feel safe um, throughout the whole year. My son has grown as a 14-year-old, um, and Paul Kwapi created the environment um, for that. He had supportive boundaries, he built trust, and held accountability. He took the time to get to know my son, to get to know me, and has worked with me and his IEP team to get the support that he needs um, since day one. He is missed. I'm proud of Tech for returning the support and respect that Kwapi has given you guys. Um, thank you. Good evening, commissioners and Dr. Wayne and our student over there. Uh, and our many students out here, I love what you guys said today. One student specifically that talked about health and safety in the schools. We know we got a bond coming. We, the union don't, the unions in the community know what the importance of the bond. The, and it serves our students and protects our students. What we do want and we want to hear from the district is our demands. This is the most efficient use of funds available according to the facilities master plan. The core functions, HVAC, electrical plumbing of the district are in serious needs of rehabilitation. HVAC and electrical repairs alone account for 48.9% of estimated costs over the next five years. This, this work needs to be done. It, there's We need transparency. I mean, I hear concerns about our trust in the district. So we wanna make sure there's transparency that the people know where the money's going and what schools and there's equity when the, two, when the district chooses what schools to have the repair work done at. So thank you, my colleagues. Hello. Uh, Keen Chukwuneta, I'm with Jobs of Justice San Francisco, also the Labor and Community Groups talking about the 2024 bond. Um, many of you know what our priorities are for the bond, right? Talking about a bond size um, that's larger, focusing on electrical, HVAC, and uh, issues like plumbing, core functionality, um, and then also uh, making sure that the bond process is transparent, right? We want a process that's ambitious, proactive, communicates with the community, uh, specifies funding priorities, and wins back the confidence of SFUSD parents, families, and staff. 
Uh, the priorities that we've laid out have been acknowledged, but not substantively addressed by SFUSD staff. Uh, they've shared fears about explicitly prioritizing funds, thinking that it could constrain decision making at work sites. And we're, while we're sympathetic to these fears, we believe that if SFUSD communicates proactively and plans budgets will offer flexibility, um, the bond program can be spotlighted as a positive spot that it has been, build trust and bring families in together to, to fix some of the problems in the district. Also around the bond size, um, we've consistently argued for a bond to be as large as possible. However, if SFUSD staff push against this and have a smaller bond, we're going to have a harder time um, because of inflation getting the same value that we've gotten in previous years. To get the same bond that we got in 20, 2016, which was $745 million, you would need a bond of $970 million Thank to you. get the same level of work. Thank you. So we want this to succeed. We Thank want you. SFUSD to succeed and help us help you. We've been coming in good faith and we want to work together to make Thank sure you. that That's the facilities of this district are competitive and can provide for SFUSD students. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mateo. I'm the Civic Engagement Coordinator with Coleman Advocates, but I'm more than anything an SF alum. I went to elementary school at Harvey Milk, James Lickford Middle, and Mission High. I would not be here today without a wonderful kindergarten teacher like Ms. Weissman, who helped me learn to speak when I was five years old, when I previously could not speak at all due to my speech disability. They are going to close the school then, but we stopped it then in 2005 at George Peabody. Why can't we stop it now here in 2024? Finally, please in the school bond and consider inflation because we are different from the 2016 levels, finance levels. I being at James Lick and Mission High, we had a lack of heating where we were freezing in our classrooms or sometimes the reverse. Please put this drop in the investment now so we don't pay the price in the future so we could fix by providing June Jordan the funding they need to prosper. I thank you for your time and have a wonderful night. Good luck to y'all. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, today I stand before you with a plea and a sense of urgency. We must prioritize the needs of the schools crying out for repair and renovation, including Bessie FEC. These are not just buildings. They are the homes of one third of our children's lives every day. They live there. The buildings deserve to be safe, healthy, and conducive to learning. I urge you to ensure that language specifically addressing the revitalization or repairs of Bessie FEC and other schools in dire need is prioritized and included in the upcoming school bond. Our children's safety and education should not be compromised by neglect or oversight. This district is more than capable of prioritizing projects and transparent while being flexible. Also, I've heard that the district is building a new school. We must ensure that this new school is not built on land designated for a much needed high school for District 6. According to the city and the Yerba Buena plans, we, are, we will continue our legacy of community involvement and advocacy. I ask that you must prioritize our children's safety, health, and education. Thank you. Protect Bessie FEC and ensure that every school in our district is Thank you. As a place for our children that can be safe and proud of. You know we can make a difference together. Please, we need your support. Thank you. I'm with Somkan and a former parent. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I need push a button. Okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Marty uh, Dulalis, and I'm also with SOMCAN. So I grew up here in the south of Marky. I went to Bessie Carmichael, and uh, I only was able to stay there until I think my fifth grade. But it was such a beautiful time, like playing with friends and just enjoying life there. But we had to fight to keep it there. There were so many times that it was going to be taken away and then facilities were not even kept up to date. But at like after I had graduated, thankfully my brother and sister were able to stay. And so like we we got like the school to get built and uh, to see new facilities. And that made a huge difference. And I'm hearing now that it's going again, like, Students are afraid of losing facilities. Students are afraid of like not being able to express themselves and how they want to be. And uh, why are we just like causing that fear for them instead of trying to make a difference? And I know we can together. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, 
Good evening, school board members. My name is Zachary Friel. I'm a D5 resident and I work at SOMCAN. I'm here to discuss the upcoming school bonds. Our students deserve healthy, safe, and comfortable living environments. As climate change makes heat waves and wildfires worse and more frequent, our schools need to upgrade their HVAC systems so that our students are protected from extreme heat and air pollution. As you know, both campuses of Bessie Carmichael are located right next to the freeway, and a ton of pollution from traffic settles on the school. Bessie's PTA president once told me that kids get their clothes covered in black carbon and soots after playing in the yard. If the air quality is this bad outside, then certainly this pollution makes its way inside as well. It's imperative that our students have access to clean air within their learning environments. We demand that this bond funds core infrastructure upgrades to systems like HVAC. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. We call the next group. Tim Tabalior or Tabalion, Lauren Harris, Cassandra Curio, Renee Pena Govea, and Cheyenne Chen. And one minute each. My name is Renee Peñagovea, and I'm a teacher at June Jordan School for Equity. While no one will admit they want to close our school, next year's proposed budget will cut us off at the knees. I'm here to remind you that you are bound by SFUSD's guardrails. Guardrail number one commits you to meaningfully consult with effective parties for effective decision making. However, Matt Wayne would cut half of June Jordan's core teaching staff. This will imperil specialized programs at the school in the area serving the highest percentage of black, low income, and disabled students. Our students also disproportionately display early warning indicators. Guardrail number two, touting support for the whole child, seems laughable when budget cuts will force our eight remaining teachers to teach multiple preps to larger classes. In contempt of the UESF contract, this also violates the board's own small schools by design policy 7123S P1, which endorses a teacher to student ratio of 1 to 25 in small schools like June Jordan. The cuts in potential closure of June Jordan slash support for the whole child, especially those children who are black, low income, or disabled. Hello, my name is Lauren Harris and I'm a policy organizer over at Coleman Advocates. I'm here because I wanna urge the district to give June Jordan the support that they deserve and to prioritize community voice in the upcoming decision on the school bond. If the bond is done right, enrollment can increase in the schools that need these improvements the most. Budget and enrollment have been brought up repeatedly within the school closure conversation. This bond is directly related and should be considered part of this long-term resource realignment plan. We urge the commissioners to work with district staff to bring students what they need. Fully resource schools that have safe and healthy facilities. This means taking June Jordan off of the chopping block, not shrinking the original bond amount, and considering the voice of community in the bond language. We stand against the potential closure of June Jordan and for transparency in this bond process. Thank you. Hello, my name is Cheyenne Chen. I am a, a school district mom and a community organizer. I find hopes in this room with all the amazing uh, young speakers in the rooms. I'm here today to speak against the parent educator cuts. Safe, quality, and equitable education starts in the classroom, and cutting our district, uh, cutting our direct services to our student, it sends a strong message to a mom and to our community that we're not centering our students' needs and our students are our future. And as a mom, I want to continue to urge our school district and our school board to think outside of the box and to be creative in finding resources that is needed to have a balanced and equitable budget that actually continue to center the students and our family's needs. For example, we can create a school task force, including parent, educator, students, and community members to find strategy to enhance our school district branding and also to enhance our schools and to, hit, to enhance our student enrollment and also support the school band. Thank you. Thank you. Cassandra? Did you? No, I was trying to help. Oh. Kim were trying to help hold Appreciate you. Kim, you okay. helped us helping. All right, got you. All right. Okay, the next group, 
Claudia, Melissa, Crystal Proctor, Jason Wyman, Sandy Amos, and Brandy Bowen. Hola a todos, soy Claudia, soy mamá Berkeley. Mi hijo salió de la escuela John Jordan y para mí la escuela John Jordan significa apoyo, integridad, seguridad, ayuda y respeto. Yo no entiendo en qué condiciones está su mente para pensar en cerrar esta escuela cuando las escuelas grandes, yo ya fui a buscar escuelas para mi hija que entra a high school y están amontonando estudiantes, las instalaciones están pésimas, tengo fotos de los hoyos en las paredes, descascarándose los techos. Ustedes quieren hacer recortes basados en qué si siguen sin darle mantenimiento a las escuelas grandes. Cuando John Jordan sacó a mi hijo de esa escuela y le brindó la oportunidad del programa de UCSF, ahora él está estudiando química, mi muchacho allá, primer año, y eso se lo agradezco a los maestros y a los programas de esa escuela. Gracias. Hi, I'm a Berkeley mom, and for me, um, the Jordan School means a lot. It means integrity, security, and respect. I don't understand in what conditions your minds are to think about closing this school when the big schools are really not appropriate. I went to uh, for search some schools for my daughter that she's going to go to high school, and all of the students are one on top of the other. The uh, school um, itself, it's in bad conditions. I have photographs of holes in the walls and the ceilings falling down. And you want to make cuts based on what? Um, I also have found some other sc uh, school programs where they have helped some other of my children. So uh, uh, please uh, take care of this school. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Crystal Proctor, longtime teacher at June Jordan School for Equity. Um, and as you know, our community has big concerns about the possibility of school closures, especially small schools. I'm here to voice how these considerations lack the integrity of just guardrail two, serving the whole child. By considering these closures, we limit environments that are actually designed to serve the development and well being of students. I've taught at June Jordan for nearly 20 years. And I can tell you firsthand that our design and size allow us to focus in on community in ways that are nearly impossible at bigger sites. We've also had very successful um, ways of giving our students a strong sense of belonging, which is especially important for our black and brown students. If the commitment of guardrail two is to not neglect the whole child, then the ask is to not neglect sites that are designed to do exactly that. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jason Wyman. Uh, I am a longstanding member of the community and an artist here. It's actually really good to see a lot of my old colleagues on the Board of Education. Uh, I'm here because I'm fighting to keep the programs that I know and I've known for over 20 years working. Um, I helped with some of the first parent and student meetings that helped form June Jordan over 20 years ago. Uh, I was introduced to peer resources while working at the OMI Accelerator Beacon Center, and I have been committed to working alongside peer resources absolutely ever since, even as a volunteer. Uh, I no longer work with SFUSD. I don't keep up on all policies. I don't really, it's not my thing anymore. Uh, but I know these programs work because I know students still in these schools. Um, and it's just frustrating to constantly have to like, advocate for the things that have proven themselves for 20 years to work over and again. And I'm just going to say that also goes for Betsy Carmichael, which has been at this table too many freaking times. Good evening. My name is Sandy Amos. I've been a teacher at Junjun for 10 years. 
Some people might be wondering why June Jordan is here tonight, since no decisions have been made on schools being closed. But it's clear from the DAC slides on the high school fact base that school, small schools are on the chopping block. And I call on Mr. Matt Wayne and the school board members to understand the importance of small schools to our most vulnerable and impoverished communities, especially in the Southeast District of San Francisco. It is a fact that 47% of students at SFUSD live in our neighborhoods in the Southeast. Yet most of the schools that are being considered for closure are in that community. It is wrong. It is simply uncalled for when the school districts, students live where they should go to school. And it's just not right that you target small schools that provide students with the sense of belonging and community that they deserve. Thank you very much. Hello, um, my name is Brandy. I'm from Coleman Advocates, also here with Jobs with Justice. I'm here to encourage the district to give June Jordan the support it deserves and also to uplift a lot of the students who are here and who are outside today. I think that it really speaks to the power of a school like June Jordan that's based in social justice, equity, education, and that has such a small, intimate community that's here to support their students and give them a loving environment where they can really advocate for themselves and really come to you all with the real solutions. And I think that's what we want our kind of education to produce. So we need to think about that as we start to build criteria and protect June Jordan. Um, also about the bond in this whole school closures criteria conversation, we've talked a lot about budget and enrollment. And I really think that if we stick with the original bond amount and we include the language that community organizations have been um, asking for in the bond that we can actually improve enrollment in our schools that need it the most and reduce um, school operating costs and actually implement healthy, safe schools. So um, here in solidarity with June Jordan and also um, make the right decision in May on May 14th around the school facilities bond. Yeah. We call the next group, please come line up. Uh, Andrew Bennett, Jordan Santana, Madeline Day, Zuzu and Najee's father, and Scott Rafferty. I told you. Good evening and thank you. Um, I'm not an auctioneer, so I'm not gonna be talking really quickly, but my hats are off to all the students here that have gotten their message across so effectively. Uh, I'm a parent of two Ruth Asawa theater tech uh, kids, and one in the program, one a graduate of the program. Additionally, I serve as the president of IATSE Local 16. Our union provides highly specialized and skilled stage film and audiovisual and event technicians to work uh, all over the Bay Area. Our organization re relies on the excellent training that SOTA Tech students receive as it prepares them for great things in our union, jobs with justice, a living wage that allows them to stay in San Francisco and not turn in, into refugees in the place that they were born. <clears throat> SOTA alumni provide uh, the backbone of our organization. Over 100 graduates work in and on events, concerts, and films all over the Bay Area. And I'm out of time, but I'm going to have to say that the capriciousness uh, and gaslighting that the school district has employed in handling the clearing of two teachers Thank you. with this no is provocation Thank is you. out of control. Thank you. The kids deserve better. Uh, good evening. I am also a parent, proud parent of a theater tech student at Ruth Asawa School of the Arts, and I'm going to speak from my heart. And hearts have been broken. Our kids' hearts are broken. Parents' hearts are broken. Um, the sudden removal of our essential theater tech faculty has been like an amputation without anesthetic. And if the board felt that this amputation was absolutely necessary, then what plan? What support system does the board have to care for the health of the rest of the body. Our tech students need real and dignified support so that they can continue to do the essential and phenomenal work that they do. Thank you.
I'm also a tech parent. As you've heard, there is a lot of turmoil at SOTA, but this could have been avoided if we had a head with an arts administration background. A principal hiring committee has been formed at SOTA, but they are not doing a national search with for someone with experience running a school of the arts. SOTA needs this. SOTA has had this in the past. A principal with more experience would have worked with the district to protect the needs of all the students in this case and mitigated this decision. We currently have an interim principal who replaced the other principal halfway through the year with no arts administration background. This is the second search for a principal in the past two years. The last search committee did not do a national search either, though they've been done in the past. This and the prior search committee is also being led by a district assistant superintendent who decisions put us in this current state of disarray. Parents, teachers, and students all want a national search for a principal with true qualifications and for it to be headed by someone from the district who understands the unique needs of an art school. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Zuzu and Najee's father. Uh, they know me as Baba. Uh, my name is Julio, and I'm also a teacher at June Jordan High School for 20 years and a graduate of San Francisco Unified. So I've been a long time here and grown, born and raised in San Francisco. When I smell something that's kind of shady, kind of oppish, kind of dirty, you got to call it out. So I'm real concerned about a man named Phil Kim who's leading this process, coming out to communities and talking about what the slideshows um, about what we're gonna, decisions we're going to make. And I'm concerned because his track record is Kip Schools privatization and charter schools. So how could we be, I'm concerned who hired him to do this process. When we talked to our people over in Oakland, every single school that was closed down, same school like June Jordan, were placed by charter schools and private schools. So we smell something much dirtier than going on for this. And we, we heard the track word on um, Mr. Wayne, I don't, I don't know enough, but we heard you're real good at closing schools down. We hope it could be something different here in San Francisco. We stand for something. I got children to fight for, a school to fight for, and a city to say that's not going to be privatized and capitalized by people who are trying to come up in the world. Sorry about that, Wendy. Thank you. I'm going to call the next group, Scott Rafferty. Scott Rafferty. Charm, Charm Consolacion, Eva Naredo, Dante Cotton, Deborah Howard, Lisa Richardson, Roberto Pena. Hey, good evening, everyone. Um, and I just want to acknowledge all of the pain and suffering that we're all going through right now. And um, I, I'm going to be a new parent at SFUSD. My child is a pre-K. Um, he is going to be in a special day class. And I'm here actually representing uh, Bessie Carmichael Filipino Education Center. I've been working for the school for over, oh my goodness, over 15 years. And I think um, what's really important right now for me is I want my son to learn Filipino. And I want to ensure that our schools are actually going to be um, safe for him. And as you heard from Maya Masaka earlier, it hasn't been fixed or it's getting fixed or it's going to be fixed or we don't know what's happening. So I just want some kind of accountability from someone, um, from any of you, please um, help support our schools. It's in dire need of so, um, like, you know, fixing our infrastructures need work. I want my child to go to the school and be proud to be a San Francisco Unified School District um, student. Thank you. Hey, good, after good evening. Just real quick, I know all you guys are teachers and educators. And it's so disrespectful, you guys being on your laptops and not hearing these kids speak. These kids come here to hear to talk to you guys. We get one minute, and majority of you guys are on your laptops, on your cell phones. I find that so disrespectful. I was here to talk about, because I had to receive the preliminary layoff notice. I've been with this district for over 23 years. But you know what's more important? That I had four kids at my school attempt suicide this year. I had a child pass away last week. What's the district doing for mental health? Because when my newcomer Latino kids attempted suicide and were in the hospital 10 days, all we gave them was a squeeze toy. 
We gave them a piece of paper. I have no Spanish speaking social workers, no therapists. I've had four kids in the hospital. I will find another job. We, none of us educators want to lose our jobs, but we also don't want to bury our kids. And I've been here before when I buried my coworker because of some of your actions. I'm not going to sit here and have one of these kids get buried because I didn't talk about mental health. So please work on that. Well, good evening. My name is Lisa Richardson, and I am a family liaison at Malcolm X Academy. And it's so interesting to find everyone here talking about the black and the brown students that you guys obviously don't care about. That's why I'm here alone today, because they don't feel comfortable coming to talk to you. I am the bridge that brings families to the school, and you want to take my job away? But guess what? The families are not going to come and talk to you. Why? Because you don't care about them. You're talking about closing four schools in the Bayview area. We have families that don't get along with one another in different areas. You want to merge the schools? You want to take away our security? The people that keeps our children safe? There's no police officers that come to our neighborhood. When we call them, we may be waiting 20 minutes. But our security guard that is at our school is on the spot all the time. I'm here to represent all the family liaisons. We need them. We need to keep them. And please do not remove them from the district. We have Thank found you. money other places. Thank you. You're welcome. Good evening. I'm, uh, my name is Dante Cotton. I'm a alumni at S San Francisco Unified District. Um, I'm, I came on behalf of my former coach. Um, I grew up in a time, um, and I'm listening to what everybody is saying. 25 years ago, schools are still, it, it amazes me that schools are still cold. You guys are cutting stuff. People like Glenn, and I don't know about anybody else. I grew up in the 90s in San Francisco, where I'm from Sunnydale. I couldn't go to HP. I get my head blown off. And you guys are talking about merging schools. You're just going to start a whole nother turf war. Again, um, don't get rid of, don't trim good fat off meat. And if you guys don't know what that, the meaning of that is, you got a steak, some of that fat observes the taste of that meat. And by you guys getting rid of some of these advisors, that's what you're getting ready to do. God bless you. you know, you're welcome. Good evening. Um, my name is Deborah Howard. I've been with the district for over 33 years. You go through all of these names of reconstitution, we got to, you know, uh, consolidate, whatever you call it, that needs to stop. The stress and the emotional stuff that people have to go through because the district say they need to work, lay off. How does this work? How are you going to lay off experienced workers that's been there for years and most of them are the ones who got the layoff notice? They're the ones who got the layoff notice. So if you're going to lay off the people with the experience, what is it that you're going to do with the ignorance of empower? We had to endure empower. We had to go through not getting paid, not getting our benefits like we should get. Right now, I'm going through not getting my Medicare benefits because the district said I didn't have, I didn't have insurance, even though I paid it for over a year and my benefits were not active. This does not make sense. We've got to get our stuff together because we've got kids out there that's looking up to us that want to be hopeful. And how can we be hopeful when the district don't have hope themselves? Okay, I'm going to call the final group. Uh, Claudia, I, I believe I may have called already, Miles Palomas de Leon, Rebecca Browning, Belinda Bellinger, pardon? Belecker Bellinger, Gary Cruz, Sarah Brandt, Patricia Barraza, <clears throat> Christina Gonzalez, and then Tiana Tillery.
Can I go? Yep. All right. My name is Rebecca Browning. I am a longtime community organizer. I'm a regional organizer. Ugh, sorry, regional organizer for Coleman Advocates. I'm a parent of a San Francisco Unified School District student, and I just want to say shame on all of you. Um, yeah, this I'm just. I also I stand with June Jordan. Um, I sat on the redesign committee with them as a parent of a student who goes to the academy. So I know the work that we put in to this redesign process and to sit there for all those months when we could all be doing something else, redesigning and developing a model to just be here to say, you know, we're closing the school or whatever is going on, shame. Second thing, and also that's gonna lead into my next point. Why do we have to stand here and sit here and beg for the schools to stay open, beg for jobs. My son went to Harvey Milk Civil Rights Academy with Coach Glenn. You know, so based building off what the other gentleman was talking about, about the mental health. I've seen Coach Glenn uh, like nonviolently restrained students and I don't know what to call, but I, I've seen Coach Glenn in action. I know what impact he has had on my son's life, and I know what impact he has had on the students' lives. So I beg you to keep his position and keep Thank his schools you. open. Thank you. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> um, good evening, district leaders. Um, I had a speech, but I'm going to go off because I want to say that I stand with June Jordan. I stand with the paras. I stand with everybody who's here fighting for their job, fighting for their community. As someone who is from District 10, from Hunters Point, used to be a San Francisco Unified School District student, also used to be a San Francisco Unified District teacher. Um, I want to talk about collusion. I want to talk about manipulation. I want to talk about people making plans and then trying to dictate to the community what the community should do instead of actually uh, using partnership and actually doing real partnership with the community by asking us what it is that we need and then making those needs actually met. Um, I've only been at ED for peer resources for two months. And in my first week, I had one of my staff members brought into a meeting with one of the district leaders and told that you need to change your program because we don't want you to keep doing what you've been doing for the last 45 years because we have to meet the bottom line. And your bottom line right now is that teachers are supposed to teach five classes and that teachers are supposed to have 33 students in their class. And that is unacceptable. It's not right. And that you're coming for a small school like June Jordan also shows that you are thinking about your bottom line and you're not thinking about what actually the community needs. And so I need y'all to stop and listen to Thank the community you. and actually do the right thing so that you can actually meet your values of social Thank justice, you. of student centered, and all the other things that you have in your values and your garbles that you Thank say you, you want to do. We need to actually see it in practice. Your words mean nothing if we do not see it in practice. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read a little excerpt from a young person at Everett. Uh, my name is Patricia. I am on the board of Peer Resources. Um, and I want to, this is a student named Suad. Um, he's an eighth grader at Everett. Um, I have facilitated and led community building activities, community circles, been trained as a restorative mediator, and led some other activities out of peer resources during the class and on my own time. My work in peer resources is important to me because it keeps it keeps me with social skills. Everybody in participation in the school helps them socialize. I feel better than how I was before being a peer leader because I can communicate better um, with others and help folks feel comfortable in our school and our um, in our peer resource class. If we had a lot of people in our peers class, I think that would be really stressful for everyone, and especially with for peers teachers. Our classes are 10 to 15 students, and if they doubled the amount of kids and changed the class sizes, I am certain that peer resource teachers would be more stressed out. I also want to point out that for each student that is trained, there are dozens of students that they serve. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Morgan Wallace. I'm a peer resources alumni uh, from SFUSD. And um, thank you so much, everyone that's spoken today. I appreciate you, June Jordan and Soda, and everybody that's here, Betsy Carmichael. Thank you for um, being here and speaking out. Um, I want to speak out for our middle school peers programs. They need a line item in the budget. They need to be, we need to have job security for those folks. It's a pipeline from middle school peers to high school peers. When I meet a student from Willie Brown, I say, oh, you know, Mr. O. 
right? When I when I meet a a, a student that just came from um, Presidio, I say, you know, Miss Jones, right? And if they say yes, I say, look, I already know that you know how to mediate. I already know that you know about violence prevention and suicide prevention and social emotional learning and how to connect with peers and create community. And so peer resources needs to continue and grow through its middle school and high school programs. Um, I'm also here to speak out uh, for our, our TSA uh, position. That's crucial for connecting the programs together so that I can make that connection from middle school to high school. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Gary Cruz and I'm a peer resources teacher at Everett Middle School. The last time I spoke at a board meeting, I was honored to receive a RAVE Award for Distinguished Service, so thank you again for the recognition. But today I'm here to say that SFUSD may not be a place for me. A Latinx gay male peer resources teacher with over 20 years of experience in peer resources who cares deeply about SFUSD's most systems impacted students. It has been proposed that peer resources teachers teach four classes of 25 students each instead of the three classes of 16 students each. In addition, we will facilitate an advisory next year. During advisory, students implement three different weekly tutoring groups. The purpose of the tutoring groups is to improve the math and reading skills of sixth graders, most of whom are Spanish-speaking newcomers who are far below grade level. On Friday, I support two groups of students to facilitate weekly community circles in two different advisory classes. The goal is to increase students' sense of belonging. At recess, my students also offer a support group for students who have been suspended. If I facilitate an advisory, that's a total of six peer-led data and mission-driven projects that I would not be able to support my students to provide, not to mention our other periodic advisory projects. Three of those projects are led by eighth graders who will receive a $300 stipend for their work. Finally, one of my classes is conducting a research project to explore ways to hold teachers accountable when they cause harm to students. The small class size makes it possible to meaningfully engage every student in one project and utilize their collective power. Thank you. Every day I'm in awe of their brilliance and I ask that you maintain the current peer resources model. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Christina and I'm part of Peer Resources and I'm actually gonna be reading some comments from our students um, from MLK. Um, good evening, dear district leaders. My name is Justin Chen and I'm in the seventh grade at Martin Luther King Jr. Academic Middle School. Through Peer Resources, I have gained peer knowledge on helping people and many more. I learned how to mediate people and to be a true leader. I feel proud proud about being a peer resources leader because I get to solve people's conflicts and help make the school a better place. If we had a lot of people in our peers classes, I could not lead our projects. I think that would not be a good because we do not have time for mediation and resources for that many people and it would make peer resources not as fun as it used to be. Peers is important in my middle school because we are because we use a talking way to solve problems and conflicts. And sometimes schools will have issues, conflicts, problems, fights, and more. I think this problem can be solved if SFUSD funds the K through eight and middle school peers and or supports peer resources and support our school. The problem of class size can also be solved if they do not enlarge classes by having meetings to discuss. Thank you. Hello, my name is SB or Sarah Brandt. If you are in this room, and I have no idea how this is going to go, you were positively impacted by peer resource in some form. If you could just stand up, I would appreciate knowing that you are here, whoever you are. Thank you. Appreciations. These are not people who came here to speak on behalf of Peer Resource. We have people online, Maria, Sharon, Susie, Madeline. Uh, they are all students from Everett, and we have students from MLK who hopefully will get a chance to speak. I am here reading the statements of other students who cannot be here tonight. My name is Joaquin, I'm in the eighth grade. Peer Resource has helped me improve in so many ways. One of my biggest improvements is talking in front of people, and now I get good grades. It's important for youth to help other youth because I want to, them to realize how their work and their worth is way more important. My work in Peer Resource is important to me because I came here for the money. But then I got so excited about being a peer resource leader because I am giving hope to other newcomers that are in sixth grade. We want to do even better like projects that have more questions and sharing ideas with other students so that in a way they can agree with. But if we have a lot of people in our class, we will not be able to do our projects and we will not be able to help others here. Thank you. Uh, 
I was going to be a little formal, but I need to be my true self. So I always start with, hey, y'all, hey. <laughs> um, good evening. My name is Tiana Tillery, and I'm the Vice President of Paraeducators with, uh, with the United Educators of San Francisco. I stand here before you today with a heavy heart and an overwhelming sense of urgency. We find ourselves in a critical moment faced with the repercussions of a decision that threatens not just the livelihoods of our valued paraeducators, but the very fabric of our school communities. The preliminary layoffs of 120 paraeducators in SFUSD have sent shockwaves through our educational system. They are not just numbers on a spreadsheet. They are individuals who have dedicated their lives to the betterment of our schools. Many of them have served for 30 years or more, pouring their hearts and souls into the shape, into shaping the future generations. But it's not just about their tenure. It's about the invaluable roles they play in our schools. These paraeducators are not mere employees. They are pillars of support, particularly for our students of color and their families. They bring cultural understanding, empathy, and deep connection to the communities that they serve. They bridge gaps, they build trust, and they foster there's so many different things in our educational spaces. Think for a moment about the impact of their absence. Who will provide that extra bit of encouragement to the struggling student? Who will be there to listen, to understand, and to guide? Who will ensure that our schools remain safe, welcoming um, safe havens for all? The loss of these paraeducators will leave a void that cannot be filled by mere numbers or budgets. We cannot overlook the fact that many of our paraeducators are people of color, particularly women. In a society where our voices are often marginalized, their presence in our schools is nothing short of transformative. They serve as role models, mentors, and beacons of hope for countless students who see themselves reflected in their faces. To rescind these layoffs is not just a matter of policy, it's a moral, job that we all should be taking into consideration. I'm losing my words, I'm sorry, y'all. Uh, we owe it to our students, to our communities, to the very ideas of equity and justice that we strive to uphold. Let's stand together in solidarity, not just with words, but with action. Let us reaffirm our commitment to the values that divine, div define us as a school district. In the face of adversity, let us choose empathy over apathy compassion over calculation, unity over division. Let us make the right choice today, not just for the sake of our paraeducators, but for the sake of our collective future. I have been your faithful servant for over 20 years. I have personally received preliminary layoff notices and have been laid off four times. So I understand what it feels like to get these notices and then have to continue to be the amazing educator that I am, but not knowing if I'll be here the next year because budgets are being balanced off their backs of some of the most lowest paid members of SFUSD. Yeah. I stand here speaking for those who are experiencing the same thing. We've been called many names here in SFUSD and beyond. Teachers aides, care professionals, paraeducators, educational support professionals, but most importantly, we're called trusting, caring adults that students and families can go to when they feel there's no one they can connect with. If, S if SFUSD moves forward with these layoffs, who will the students and families stay connected with? Let's not have to worry about that. Just send the layoff notices. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ms. Hillary. And I wanna just know for the public who may be wondering, we, gen we generally do defer to our uh, union leadership to give them a little bit of extra time, which is why that time was extended uh, past some of the other ones. Um, no, I didn't think you were, but just wanted to just, but just wanted to be clear that we're we're trying to be fair and equitable to everybody. Um, is that it, Mr. Steele? Are we have are we good? On yes, the public that, comment? that's all we have. For all right, thank you again for everybody who was here for public comment, um, and we're uh, really appreciate it. Really appreciate you taking the time to be here and for expressing your opinions. Uh, it really matters. And for those of you online, I apologize. We did not have time to get to online public comment. But again, we do. We are available by email. Uh, the email address is on our uh, website. Um, and, um, you know, we do encourage you to, to please get in touch with the board. Um, 
and now we'll move to another very um, important um, item, which is our uh, report from the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander uh, Matua Advisory Council. So we're going to take just a you know minute or two to transition. Let let's let. Uh, in fact, why don't we uh, take a take a you know one minute pause while we let people exit and we um, let you all get set up. All right, let's um let's begin again. And if you're still in the audience, please um direct your attention up here and let's um cease the conversation so that we can resume our meeting, please. Thank you. Uh, good evening again, everyone. I am very pleased to welcome can I, uh, I'm sorry, can I ask everyone to can you all uh, we're trying to restart the meeting? All right, so hello again. Um, I'm very excited to welcome our uh, presenters from our Matua Advisory Council. What I really want to appreciate about the Matua Advisory Council, and you'll hear this tonight, they've been here before I've had a chance to meet with them, and they're an advisory council that doesn't just say, here's our advice, please do it. They're actually, how can we work together to really reach our students and families? And you're going to see tonight the evidence of really them rolling up their sleeves and helping us to do better and do right by our NHPI students. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ursula Santiago and the team to present. Thank you so much, uh, Superintendent Dr. Wayne. Uh, good evening, all board commissioners, families, community in the audience, uh, for the opportunity to share the FASAMO initiative and the Mato Advisory Council presentation tonight. Um, in our presentations tonight, we hope to share a brief history of the FASAMO initiative, high-level updates, and end with sharing many bright spots in programming this year in alignment with our vision, values, goals, and guardrails. To ground us tonight is a Samoan proverb that says, Uoto fa ivai, um, ayala iai. The meaning of this proverb is, although the present may be difficult, there is hope for the future. Uh, next slide. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> uh, introducing the team. So uh, our presenters for tonight are Herbert Ila Leo, AKA Coach Wiley, who is our Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander coordinator in SFUSD, uh, in Office of Access and Equity. Anna Mahina, uh, who is our SFUSD parent, representing our MATO Advisory Council uh, board. And lastly, my name is Ursula Ann Siatanga. Uh, I'm the special assistant to the superintendent overseeing the FASAMO initiative. Um, now I'll pass it over to Coach to go ahead and start us off with a Samoan introduction and um, continue on with a English translation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ursula. Ole au le to i falo ina le afro loa pe o te to i la lafo foer savil i fanga tau le o ta otto le o pe au le alafo le o le atu e o te tai i no o tau fai pu e le o filoa matila. 
wa sila saanga inei luper foanga ina wa sansangi fa manwao le sil fa inga wa lele wa ta oto fa ut poto pa ia ma ma malu ta to wa fi fi biela yor ta pa usilio le lang ilo na lo fa mo na nga le si sirias um fa ye on ta to la lu fi sil fa i ilo na ma to wa fi mo lo na ma ta las to lo na le pa ia fa ta fa ma ota ma le la ai to lo na la ta po inga sa mo o yo le mo mala Ole ai vi via o sa mo fa inga mai le va se yo le fa va Tulo, ayo la au seu mata to anga i se ngangana e malam lama u mairo ta to awhia. As important as it is for us to acknowledge the original landowners and inhabitants of this land, it is also important for us to acknowledge our ancestral lineage, to pay homage to those that came before us, that have paved the way for where we stand today. In Samo we say, ma lo le soi fu maua ma le langi ma, meaning greetings and good tidings to you all. During my brief introduction in my native tongue, I also acknowledge and embrace the essence of your lineage and origins by profoundly addressing your honorifics and salutations of past to be present with us while we weave our thoughts and ideas together. There's a saying in Samoa, <laughs> Translated as, today I shall not fish from the reefs nor from the nets that have been casted, but I shall fish from the depths of the ocean for a much more meaningful outcome in community. Thanks, Coach. Um, uh, next slide, please. So here we have a timeline uh, from when the happy, which was the Hawaiian and Pacific Islander resolution that was passed by the school board in 2018. On this timeline, it shows when we hired positions such as targeted focus efforts on educator recruitment work, NHPI liaison, and my current position in the office of the superintendent. Uh, this timeline also shows that in 2020, uh, when the 2018 resolution was amended to include 28 directives that included to build out the FASAMO initiative. Uh, in, in the slides later, uh, we will talk more about efforts this year that align with our goals and guardrails. Uh, next, next slide, please, thanks. Uh, Pacific Islander student population in SFUSD uh, today is currently at 974 with 55% identifying as Samoan. And of the total Pacific Islander population, we have 29% receiving special education services. The Pacific Islander community continues to advocate for racial equity and data equity locally and nationally. Uh, one Pacific Islander community leader shares, when we are counted, we are seen. When we are seen, needs can be met. In our community, uh, continue to face Erasure, invisibility, and inadequate access will continue to experience disproportionate negative impacts across education, health, immigration, labor, and several other sectors. Uh, next slide. Oh, that's you? Oh, oh thanks. Thank you. <laughs> like, next game. She got me. She got me. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, th this data, uh, this data shown uh, may be included in our, our progress monitoring updates this year with our goals and guardrails. However, briefly sharing where Pacific Islander students' uh, progress looks like between fall of 2023 to winter of 2024 in our literacy, math, college and career readiness goals, including our interim goals and guardrails. One thing to note is today's presentation uh, will focus on the faces of the data. I'd like to pass it over to Ana Mahina to share more about specific uh, MAC recommendations between 2019 and 2024 and their current status. Thank you, Arslan. Uh, I should know this, right? Um, <laughs> thank you, Arslan. Here's a selected matua on the next slide, please. Um, 
or parent, Matua means parent in uh, most of our languages, um, recommendations for 2023. And they are ongoing recommendations and we've completed a formation of a parent group and a board. Um, these recommendations are vital to the work of SFUSD core values uh, to uplift the FASA more initiative and to elevate the Pacific Studies pathways, the recruitments and efforts of our NHPI staff. And lastly, the recommendation is to expand and support the Pacific Islander content curriculum and events. Next slide, please. And I'll pass the mic back to Coach to speak on some of the amazing programs for our Pacific Islanders. A few of the programs centering Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander students in SFUSD. A few of the programs centering uh, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander students within SFUSD. For example, each and every student by name initiative, increased literacy for Black and Pacific Islander kindergarten students for school years 2023 to 24. Fossil Fridays provide a monthly read aloud or cultural activity to elementary students. Books by Pacific Islander authors are read. Culturally relevant discussions and reflections follow, which is an alignment of our goals, third grade literacy and guardrails serving the whole child. Per one of the faculty members that we have in SFUSD, we need more Pacific Islander chapter books. Next slide, please. Our Vasa High School Pathway, which is a two-course dual enrollment offering to our high school students. Completion includes CCSF, Certificate of Achievement in Critical Pacific and Oceania Studies, connected to annual Vasa conferences. In alignment of our goals of college and career readiness, guardrails serving the whole child, strategic partnership. Per our students, we need more teachers that look like us. Pass it over to Anna. Thank you, Coach. So um, I will speak on the Matua Advisory Council. Matua means parent. Oh, next slide. next slide, please. Oh, there you go. Um, Matua means parent or elder in most of our languages of the Pacific Islands. Um, the purpose of the Matua Advisory Council is to increase the participation in decision-making at schools and district-wide to improve school to home relationships, to strengthen partnerships and communication, to offer programs for youth and families, and to advise the use of the yearly budget, to participate in fully, to participate fully in the planning and development of implementation and evaluation of the services and activities provided by the FASAMO initiative um, with, with the guardrails effective decisions making strategic and partnership. Um, now I'll pass it back. Um, oh, in some of the slides you will see some photos and you'll see the our first Mac group photo of the year. We have our uh, chairs and co-chair there, um, also recruiting some of our parents. And then you also see on the bottom how our VASA is. We have our elders to our young, um, students on VASA Recruitment Day. I'll pass it now back to uh, Coach. Next slide, please. Thank you, Anna. Not only did we center and specify programs for our students, we also created a program to bring in together all our Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander employees within San Francisco Unified School District. Um, the purpose of this was to bring our staff under one roof to share our resources and to create a communal sense of learning for us to raise awareness on how impactful our roles are in nurturing and cultivating our students. Also to reintroduce the essence and importance of our mana. Per the administrators who were there that day, we need to create racial infinities, affinity spaces to build communities in such a huge district. Anna, back to you. Thank you, Coach. In the slide, I will share the Talanoa series or the talk stories. Talanoa means to talk. Talanoa series is uh, weaves together the Vasa or the ocean. Talanoa series focuses on Pacific Islander content, the scholars in professional development, and the leadership opportunities for all who works with our NH and PI communities. 
Um, you can see in resolution 183-13A1, where it states staff are provided the training to meet the needs of the NHPI students. Um, I'm give it back to you, Coach. Next. Next slide. Please. Next slide, please. We have two events. Ooh, no, before that one, but thank you. We have two events for this semester. First of all is this Friday, which is the seventh annual Vasa High School Conference. I would gladly invite everyone who was here today, if you guys could please be there. I know Dr. Matt Wayne was there last year, mm -hmm. and our kids had a blast, right? Uh, that is our Vasa Conference. And then most importantly, we had an event called La Langa Le Atto just two weeks ago which is called Weaving the Basket, specifically catering to our rising freshmen and sixth graders in the district. A survey prompted three years ago with students who are now currently juniors in high school gave us the recommendation that this void needed to be filled. The lack of information and preparation that is needed to arm them with the correct tools in high school as to why some of the students who are currently juniors in high school today are still struggling with requirements that are needed to graduate on time. And also to prepare our rising elementary students for what to expect in middle school. As we all know, these changes that are both physically, mentally, and emotionally. Anna, take us home. Hey, we're going home, you guys. <laughs> um, thank you, coach. Um, here are some additional information and the MAC recommendations for the school year 23-24 as a reference. And so if you're interested in getting involved and helping in any of the events, the programming to connect with Coach or Ursula, we as parents will continue to advocate for our NHPI students and the families to be seen, to be heard in SFUSD. We would love to end this presentation with the proverb, Watofa Ibai, Although the present may be difficult, there is hope for the future. Thank you for the space provided to share with you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, every year I've been on the board, your presentation has been one of my favorite moments because uh, you bring forward the, the um, strength of the Pacific Islander community and also um, talk more and more about how, you know, I think we are making progress in it and there's so many things that we need to improve on, but I think your uh, leadership really is important in that. So thank you. Um, let's open it up to the board for comments, questions. Uh, and students, would you like to start? And then we'll go to along this way to, with Commissioner Weissman Ward. Um, when I was doing research to become student delegate and to run in the election, uh, one of the things I spent the most time on was actually your initiative because I saw so much hope and promise there. And it's wonderful to see this presentation. And thank you very much for all you're doing. I just want to say this presentation was so beautiful, and I really appreciate just learning about how you guys are making it more cultural, trying to promote more culturally relevant literature and making sure students feel like they're represented in the books that they read and the, the content that they see within the classroom. And that's something that the school district should definitely work on as a goal that all the content should be more relatable to the students that are represented within the student body. This is the time for thanks and then questions for maybe staff. <laughs> okay. um, Dr. Wayne is going to be coming to you in a moment. Um, so I want to echo the thanks. I think there's definitely going to be a theme of gratitude. I think this is now my the third presentation that I have been um, you know, fortunate enough to to be a part of and to listen to. And every time I I learn more and I I um I, I think just the, the work and the fortitude and the commitment um that is clearly unwavering is is really inspiring for us all. I have a question though that I'm gonna to direct to, I think Dr. Wayne. Um, so we have seen a, a, a pattern of um, recommendations that come forward. And I do, I agree with with Vice President Alexander that I think we're, we are seeing some, more and more things where we can start saying like, yes, we're there, this is in progress, where I think 
in prior presentations, it was like the, you all have come to us and said these are really important things, and there wasn't as much progress, if any progress. And so I'm glad to see some progress, but obviously there needs to be a lot more done on our end. And um, one of my questions, I guess, for you, Dr. Wayne, is you know, given how much thought has gone into these recommendations and the conversations. Um, I, this relates to the research alignment initiative. How are we making sure that we're not just incorporating the feedback that we're getting right now in this moment, you know, April 2024, but that we are incorporating the feedback and the 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 information that's been shared with us today in prior years to make sure that we don't lose though that those recommendations, those priorities, those the, those the, making sure that we're not just saying, oh, well, we're just going to start now and what, whatever we hear starting April 2024 is what we're taking into account. And whether that's relating to making sure that we have more capacity and, mm -hmm. and teachers that, that look like folks in, in, the, in the schools or uh, culturally relevant literature or whether that's space. I know that, you know, SCDC and, and this space has been a, a long a, a conversation that has happened and happened and happened. And we're talking about buildings and space and resource alignment. So I'm just, I would love to know in the context specific specifically of, of Matua and the recommendations, how are we incorporating these really thoughtful recommendations in the overall RAI process? Um, sure, I'll, I'll speak to three ways and Ursula can add on. Uh, first, I appreciate um, slide uh, six, where we highlight some of the progress as well as um, you know uh, where we still need to make progress for the recommendations. And you're starting to see that in all the presentations. Whether we have followed through or not, we want to note, like, here's a progress. And even we had a conversation being honest of, like, where we're not making progress and why, and maybe we're focusing our energy there. So that's one, um, where we're specifically working with the initiative um, on following up on the recommendations. Two is, um, you know, this is where, you know, in how we've reorganized our LCAP task force and really putting forward the parents' perspective and having the advisory committees on the LCAP task force, these recommendations go that to go there as well, so then become part of our broader plan. And then third, what I really appreciate the, the um, advisory council did, which this is really actually, it's a ask uh, a, um, of working, it's an ask not just of district staff, but of the advisory councils. The board has set these goals and guardrails. How are we aligning our work to support these goals and guardrails, because that's what the resource alignment is about, right? How are we setting up our educational system? So I really appreciate, and this is what we're seeing and, and challenging our advisory councils to do as much as they tell us, here's the support we need. It's like, okay, how is this lining up with um, you know, our goals that we've identified? So that's where you're starting to see the connections and the presentation and then how it informs the work that we're doing. So those are three ways. I don't know if you have any more you wanna add. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. Uh, I would say transformational work takes time. <laughs> um, I also know that due to time constraints within the in our meeting today, we weren't able to share like some of the implementation monitoring on other MAC recommendations that they gave us 25 in the last three years. This includes our resolution that's uh, 28 directives. And so we're definitely working through each one of them uh, to prepare uh, for 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 public announcements, but we're definitely working across across departments, across community based organizations, across school sites, <laughs> across after school programs. So we're definitely working um, alongside everyone in, in the capacity that we're in. Thanks. Thank you so much. I uh, just want to thank you again for the presentation and all the hard work you do um, and all the roles that you kind of hold to help push the district forward and to make sure that the voice of families, students, and community um, is centered in the decision making and um, the thought process of the district. Um, my question, I think, is to the superintendent. Um, I, I, I would love to get, um, I guess, a little bit more clarification as far as it is the long term, the long term commitment that the district has that you're kind of entering all this different planning we're going through to maintain this work, to expand this work. I think what I'm curious about is 
knowing that our goals don't reach equitable outcomes for students who are African American or who um, are Pacific Islander, what is the plan ultimately to get them there? Is that a commitment that the district has? And how are we reflecting that commitment in this current planning? Um, and, and I guess what assurances are there to families that these things will not, I guess, be all that there is, but that there is, I guess, a, a bigger commitment to serving um, these students and improving the outcomes um, and really solving the issue where this district is failing these students and their ability um, to access the, the best educational offerings and outcomes we have in the district. And so I would love your, your thoughts on how we're planning to address that, or if we're, we're not, um, love to hear that as well. Yeah, I, you know, I think I mean you hear a lot in our progress monitoring about how we're working to set up the systems to improve uh, the educational outcomes for our students, and particularly some of the targeted approaches we're taking, like to each and every initiative. I think what so you know, there's the improving the the system, but then this is where why we're staying committed to initiatives like the uh, Fasamoa initiative and the Ali initiative because there still needs to be a, a additional level of support and accountability for serving those students. So that's where I think as we're making the systemic changes, um, where you know how are we making our these initiatives help make sure that those changes are uh, we're incorporating the needs of the students. So we mean to serve. So Ursula has shared. Well, what are, you're in, are you in year three now of your uh, position? Just her learnings. I, well, I, I'll let you say them yourself. But her learnings of like her just being this great. She's out of the office of the superintendent, but really the need to work with other departments and divisions to move forward th with the work. Like when we're talking about staffing um, or some student programs. So that so it's the system improvement, but then having these initiatives to ensure that that system is paying attention to the students who we've underserved, uh, um, th you know, throughout. I appreciate that. I, I guess that doesn't, I guess, fully answer my question. I, I definitely appreciate the work that they're doing, that the um, the Ali program is doing, as well as like the family components. But I guess that doesn't necessarily address what the district is doing to address those structural gaps, unless we're saying that we have funded these like solutions to the place that they can resolve the issue. I guess what I'm concerned about is are we satisfied with maintaining the status quo or are we actually trying to have substantive change for these communities, which are small, which have been negatively impacted by the district? And I guess I don't I don't see where that is at. And I don't know if there's a, a plan for that or if that's part of the, the larger plan that's being developed. But I guess I'm just worried that all this great work is is essentially being developed out, but it's still very siloed and isn't connected to a larger overall strategy and really limits the ability to support all students and really puts a huge burden on staff and family leaders um, to solve a problem that is actually the districts and that they're not equipped or structurally supported to address. Um, and so I, I would just say, I think in the future, it'd be helpful to hear how all of this relates back to the larger plans of the district and whether or not the district has a long term plan to continue these things at the current rate or to increase them, because I think right now it's not clear to me that we're committed to this for the long term that we're going to be here in 10 years talking about how this work has grown and blossomed or we're going to talk about how. This is the exact same stuff that we're still doing, and we still haven't created equity for students. And so that turned into a speech. But I think the key point of it is um, I would love when these presentations come that the staff is really talking about what they're doing in addition to what uh, the programs are doing, because there's a big gap um, that doesn't seem anyone is taking responsibility for. And it's concerning for me because it feels like students might be falling through it. And while while you called it a speech, there were some questions, and I, then I guess I want to just provide some commentary on the speech. So one one thing that you're saying is I, I I don't know that I agree with the framing of it. There's the district, there's the parents, there's the Fasoma initiative. Like as we're separate entities, we're all trying to work together. Like we're all part of the district to work together. Now we have different roles and responsibilities. So my takeaway from your your comments are when we present things, like when the the Matua Advisory Council presents, um, you know, like slides that talk about program centering Pacific Islanders. When we talk about our high school pathways, like a high school pathway, we have a broader 
CTE pathway strategy, this is a perfect, to me, it's like the, the, an example of, okay, and here's how we're doing that specifically for Pacific Islander students. So I guess the, the feedback I take away is we need to be very clear then how this is being integrated into those systemic approaches, not that the district does one thing, Matua does another, and we hope that they are going to have the result. They need to be working together. So if you're not hearing that, that's helpful feedback about how we could how we could uh, deepen the work and deepen the connections. No, thank you. I appreciate it. I guess also too, like what knowing what is our long term commitment to these things and whether or not our commitment is to maintain the status quo or if our commitment is over time to grow, to increase the impact and to double down on the work. I think without that, all of this feels more like window dressing than something of substance. Well, I can I do want on the record our commitment to improving the outcomes for our students, not just maintaining the status quo. And then again, how to make sure that that comes through in, in these presentations is, is important. Commissioner Sanchez. Thank you. I uh, really want to thank you for your work uh, around all the issues that you tackle daily in our district um, with our students in the Pacific Islander community. Just to give some little historical context since I'm the old person at the table always. Um, <laughs> back, in the, back in the day when I was first on the board, in, I wanna say in 2003 or four, there were folks from the PI community that would come to the board meetings and request and then start to demand more, a seat at the table basically. And you know what the board did at that time? Nothing. You know what the district staff at the time did? Nothing. And it was years and years of work. It was, and this is why representation really mattered. Um, when Commissioner Faugo Malinga was elected or appointed first and then elected to the Board of Education, that's when there was a real seat at the table. That's when this resolution that created this body was formed. And, and um, he was the first and so far only elected uh, Pacific Islander person elected to a body in this in this city. And it's a shame in my view um, that he's no, no longer with us on the board. Um, but represent, representation again does matter because had he not been on the board, we wouldn't have this body in my view. So I really wanna have a shout out to him and appreciate him and the hard work. Um, and I really wanna thank you again for your, for your work. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Lamb. I didn't realize I was going to get emotional just hearing about Commissioner, former Commissioner Maliga, um, and just big shout out to him and the community that's been doing the work for many years to where we're at today. So thank you to the staff and thank you to the um, Matua Advisory Council. A um, couple questions that I do have um, since beyond what my colleagues have raised and also what was um, shared um, from school board members questions. So that's also shared with the public um, as well, some pre-questions um, to the um, advisory council's presentation. Um, one thing around the each and every initiative that I'm so excited about is the investment from the district to being no able to know the each and every student by name. And when I look at our PI student population of 974, I consistently ask, why not? Couldn't we do that for our PI students specifically, no matter if they're with us in preschool all the way till the time they're in, they're in 12th grade um, with us? So um, I had a question I'm going to hone in specifically to the college and career, um, because I do also feel like with that third goal, um, we are also deepening our um interim um, guardrails, um, interim um, goals, and how we're gonna meet that. And specifically, uh, my question to the team is, you know, investing in um, a dual enrollment um, that we have right now in partnership with City College, uh, what has been most impactful so far in seeing and working with students um, specifically in increasing our goal of increasing the number of students um, that are college and career ready, either going to apply for college or exploration around um, careers like CTE pathways. So just want to hear a bit more in the work you all have been engaged with or would like to further uh, deepen the work. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Julie Lam. Uh, so, uh, 
our current uh, dual enrollment courses, which is the interdisciplinary 45 and interdisciplinary studies 46. These are two uh, Pacific Islander history course uh, taught at City College of San Francisco and the Oceana and the Arts course. Uh, I think one of the highlights for this specific semester is that we were able to have this course be taught at Balboa High School. Um, another thing to know is I'm also the current uh, instructor for that class. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so it's been amazing to, again, figure out ways to weave many things. We've seen movement in the Pacific Islander uh, curriculum development work in, in, in the community colleges, in the universities, and there was a gap with K-12. And so right now, it's been just amazing to see that as we as the Pacific Islander community has been advocating for a long time for data equity, and this is across all everything, uh, that having to see Pacific Islanders in a district goal and guardrail and interim goal uh, is the biggest lift and the, one of the biggest steps of moving things uh, is to be seen in the data. Um, and in accurate data. So I would say we're definitely having fun. I know that students were asking if they should come tonight to support. We told them, please do your assignments, your homeworks. <laughs> uh, it's okay. They wanted to come, you know, uh, but you, you know, we're all gonna be at the VASA conference on Friday where they will also be able to showcase a couple of things that they've learned within the course um, in the arts. And so, I would say that bond with the partnership that's happening with our curriculum and instructions department, really trying to build out dual enrollment work. Just big shout outs to like Balboa High School for really like, we're gonna help you and we're going to figure out every possible way because this is what we need at this school the students asked for. And so for us to be able to provide has been definitely rewarding. Uh, yeah, so I would say and. And to add on to that, so that is the academic side of what we're working on, but there's also the technical trade of this year we have, for the first time, we've had 10 interns for a summer work work program, where we're now working on career technical trades like HVAC, electrician, right? And also providing these students with a financial literacy course on understanding what credit is, what real life uh, scenarios are for them to further their understanding. So that way, if that is not it, then maybe being in the workforce is the next step forward. Thank you. Um, and for the superintendent, yes, I would say as a feedback to the team, um, yes, further integration, because as we know, the highest concentration of PI students, uh, for example, in high schools is in the six Southeast schools. Um, and so an example would be, so for Pacific Islander children, students, who young people who may not be in those concentrated schools, how are they gonna receive those supports? I'm curious, you know, around the integration, for example, into the counseling approaches or within the high school team. So that's one thing to, I think that would be certainly helpful moving forward around that progress monitoring. On the chronic absenteeism, we have seen some progress, and I know it's been a huge lift in partnership with community to making this progress happen. So just want to give the chance to the team to also share um, what has been working, what have been some of the ways to be able to sell, you know, to see um, progress from the year before, and what do you all see in the horizon of what's going to be necessary in order to continue that upward trajectory of um seeing and you know to be able to make some progress um and and ensuring that our young people are feeling connected and wanting to uh, come to their schools and being part of their school community i would say uh in terms of chronic absenteeism there's definitely been movement around figuring out ways of embedding content Pacific kind of content curriculum uh, sharing resources. Uh, I think that right now what's been helpful is that the district as a whole is working on chronic absenteeism, right? So for all of us, we're just like, how can we support? There's been internal, amazing internal moves as well of like, 
having current Pacific Islander employees help to support in that effort as well. So that helps because many people know, you know, what churches our families attend, you know, like they know what community-based organizations are in community. And so it's very helpful when, when the whole district is doing it at the same time. Like we don't know what's working, but we know something's working because <laughs> everybody's doing things simultaneously. But I would say things like that, like leaning into our current employees, uh, that are also, you know, that are Pacific Islands to help in that effort. Thank you very much for this amazing presentation. And I'm sorry to point at you, Dr. Siataga, but I just did want to make sure that you got the credit for all the amazing work you have done to build out the dual enrollment pathway for our students. It has been a heavy lift and you you have been at the forefront of it. So thank you for everything you are doing and the team that's behind you. But without you at the point, leading the leading the boat, paddling, building it, all of it at the same time, um, we would, I think, still be stuck in the middle of the ocean. So thank you. Um, uh, hope for the future and respect for those who came before us. I really appreciate those concepts. Um, and to further pile on to the appreciation for our former commissioner, uh, Malinga, I, I, um, he was one of the ones who first pointed out to me that how demoralizing it can be to see yourself as an asterisk instead of uh, the, the, the numbers. And that's true for many of our Pacific Islanders, Native Hawaiians, um, but African-American students who are low enrollment at some of the larger schools, is, as Commissioner Lane pointed out, or English language learners or newcomers at some schools. So something very important for us to remember. Um, you set a an amazingly, an amazingly high bar for community collaboration, integration, bringing multi-generations together, showing us what sense of belonging means, um, connecting us to culture and community. Um, and one of the things that I really appreciated, uh, one of my um, colleagues asked, um, and Commissioner Lamb, you had mentioned it as well. Um, the schools in the classrooms, one of the questions in the, the information on board docs is, are there any schools or classrooms where Pacific Islander students have significantly lower absenteeism or higher achievement than their Pacific Islander peers district-wide? And there are seven schools who currently have 75% or better attendance. And those schools have a large population of NHPI students. Six out of the seven are located in the Southeast sector. Six out of seven of these schools have at least one or more Pacific Islander employees or have an after-school program where the lead coordinator identifies a Pacific Islander. And the one school that has no Pacific Islander employee is supported by the CSACE team in the Each and Every by Name initiative. So those are the strategies to me that are working. So having said that, um, and in the spirit of transparency and accountability, um, my question for staff is one, to your point, I would love to do a deeper dive, um, you know, and, and I appreciate your recognition that there's only so much time, but you had mentioned that there are 28 now total initiatives, love to see details. Um, yeah, because you don't have enough on your plate already. Um, but on slide six, um, with the selected Matua Advisory Council recommendations, uh, we have five bullet points. I would love to see how these cascade um, and, and get more details here um, into, you know, ongoing great. What does that mean? Help me understand what that means and, and who's running the initiatives here um, and what resources they need to continue the work, what resources we've already provided that are successful. Um, and my one a very specific question I have for staff is how and what are we specifically doing to recruit more NHPI staff? But I also want to recognize at the same time as we did with the Ali presentation, it's not fair for our Pacific Islander staff to hold all the work uh, um, of of the outcomes of our Pacific Islander and Native and our NHPI students. It's all of our job. We are all responsible for improving the outcomes. Um, and we recognize that representation is important at, important at the same time. So I think those are my real asks. One, a deeper dive into these five priorities and um, and the, the initiatives that are cascaded, who's doing what, like I, I won't repeat myself. Um, and also, um, hiring. So thank you.
I, I think Ursula wanted to share about the hiring. Okay. You look like you did, so say. <laughs> if not, that's fine. We have another question. So uh, currently we have uh, Selala Zumbado, who is who was hired on to help support um, NHR in the recruitment team for a uh, work stream that includes uh, targeted focus recruitment for Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander. <laughs> They're building out their team. Um, they've been real busy. <laughs> uh, but the they've been involved in making sure that they're informing the the rest of the Pacific Islander community on uh, positions and that communication. We knew that there was like little gap pockets, but now we have like point people that we can share information that will help disseminate information to the rest of the community. So I would say. Uh, we're, we're still ongoing and working. I think the hiring is across the board. That's why she couldn't be here because they're like uh, busy because it's definitely recruitment season. Thank you for that. I hope that work continues to be ongoing. And also I apologize, I won't be able to attend um, Friday. I was honored to be there last year and participate in the Kava ceremony. It was my absolute pleasure. So um, I highly encourage everyone else to attend. Thank you. Student Delegate Simpson. One recommendation is looking at being able to give students field trips to events like these, because like you're telling me about this event and I want to go, but I can't because I'm only really free for that during school hours. And I think looking at just asking like a select group of students, like sending a certain amount of slips to every school based on their school population or specifically based on say their NHPI population and then being like, hey, like these students are welcome to come and we have like, and we can make sure that you have a staff member available, make sure to give you a sub to be able to get those students there. Cause I think students really appreciate those kinds of opportunities and that will contribute to everyone's sense of belonging across multiple cultures, but specifically for not only NHPI students to learn about that, but for their peers to learn more about their culture and what's important to them. Um, also suggestion is, I think that like hearing about how important consistent staffing is and having staff that look like you in your schools. Like I can speak personally about success rate, my success rate when I went to a school with multiple black teachers, my success rate when I had even one black teacher versus my success rate when I now have zero like literally zero academic black teachers. And I think that when you're thinking about sense of belonging and specifically chronic absenteeism, which I know has been a huge problem, I think if you look at each school site and see, if you look at those numbers, like how many educators you have that look like the students that go there, and then you look at chronic absenteeism, you'll see that those numbers do have some sort of correlation. And also I want to suggest that you work with this team to find out how to get more CCSF pathways in schools, like directly inside those schools. Cause I know what's been a barrier for me and a lot of fellow students is the fact that I have to go somewhere and like, I just can't get there and I can't commit to being there at all those times. And I think that that would be really, really helpful. And I would have really appreciated that in my student career. So it seems like this team has been very successful doing that, and I absolutely applaud you for that. But working with them to span that, like widen that, would be, I think, a really great idea. Yeah, that's great. And wait, just to be clear, I think that because I think this is a really great idea. So you're saying because like for the for the um, event on Friday, we're bringing kids from our schools, right? To, and but you're saying that like if you know the school has 50 Pacific Islander students who are invited. Uh, add 10% to that and offer it to other students to learn, right? Th is that what you're saying? Yeah. And I think yeah. being very like transparent or like making it super clear to everybody that like you have an invitation to this event, this event is happening. Like you have the opportunity to go. Cause I know we did that with our youth summit and that was really helpful. Just having all the permission slips there and letting people know that like they absolutely could go, got a lot more attendance and it was a really nice day for everybody, at least there. And I'm sure it will be and could be like a nice day for more students who would be able to attend yeah. something like VASA. Yeah. And I'm just saying that I appreciate that because we have other, Ali does events with students. We have other, uh, and that might be a good practice for us to integrate. So let's, let's talk about that one. Yeah. And I think what that does, which is brilliant, is it um, 
it shows the rest of the SFUC community, the, the incredible strength of the Pacific Islander community. And it also like does the thing we were talking about, which is makes it clear that the education of Pacific Islander students and their, you know, ex, you know, their growth and excellence is not is is the concern of everybody, right? And that that becomes a shared mutual process and is about really building these webs of relationships. And I think that's, you know, just maybe to close, like I think um, Dr. Siotaka, I don't think it's a coincidence that you're in the superintendent's office and you're also the instructor of the class because that's you're in the you're in the churches and all these places like that those things that web of relationships that you have is is modeling actually how to implement our how to reach our academic goals in line with our guard, guardrails when we talk about educating the whole child like that's you're living it and you're also living it this this idea of high expectations and high and and rigorous standards around prep preparation for college and career so i just think for me it's like you're kind of modeling for everybody what what we ought to be doing for the entire district and so we should be the learning needs to go in, in all directions here and so um so yeah i'm just super super grateful and my other gratitude is um i want to just add my the plus one to the gratitude to commissioner molinga for his leadership um in making this happen and um you know, and really the whole Pacific Islander community in San Francisco for, as Commissioner Sanchez was talking about, for for decades really saying, you know, we need to be heard. And again, it's not, that's not just to benefit the PI community. It's also to benefit all of us. And I think it's been, so we're all in, in your debt. And um, so thank you. All right. Real quick, because we got to move. The event happening at City College on Friday is, I mean, this is a regional event. We this is I just want to point out that, you know, this is a beacon for the entire Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community through the whole Bay Area. It is such a, an amazing event. It draws people in from everywhere. And so it's a community builder within San Francisco, but within the whole Bay Area, too. It's so kudos to putting it on and and, and being such a connector above and beyond the city. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, and thank you again. And so we're going to move on to the facilities master plan update, which is our next item. Um, yes, I want to bring up the team for that, and they can get started in the update. Okay, um, you got you all can go ahead. Uh, Superintendent will be back in a minute. Okay, hi, good evening, commissioners. Thank you um, for having us. I my name is Karen Sullivan. I'm the executive director of capital planning. I'm here with Lisinia Ibere, the bond program director, and we will be presenting tonight on some updates on the facilities master plan. Next slide, please. Um, so the facilities master plan was adopted at the Board of Education meeting in May of 2023, and it is the facilities department 10-year work plan that will guide our capital investments into our real estate. I think for us, one of the big takeaways from the facilities master plan is that the need for our properties is great. If we were to replace all of the systems throughout our buildings, um, the total investment need would be six million. And on an annual basis, when you look at our non-bond funding sources, um, the, fund, the revenue that we get is about six million with various restrictions. And so the need that we have across our school sites is greater than the funding that we have. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the facilities master, master plan helps us guide our capital investments by setting emerging priorities that allow us to prioritize where we will invest our limited resources. Next slide, please. Can I just clarify? You said six billion with a B is mm -hmm. our need, correct? Not six. Across the entire portfolio to replace everything in kind. Thanks for clarifying. Um, this is an overview of the investments that were made in 2023. 
what we like about this map is the geographic diversity of our investments. And we feel that it also really reflects the seriousness that we've taken the priorities included in the facilities master plan um, as we have made investments throughout the year in alignment with those goals. Next slide, please. So within the facilities master plan, we have three categories, um, health and safety, learning environments, and policy directives. Within each of those categories, we have 13 emerging priorities, and each priority was assigned its own pacing, so how quickly we would want to deploy, to deploy resources towards that initiative. There, since the adoption of this plan, there has been one change to pacing, and that's to the zone-based student assignment. Um, that priority has changed from defer to a schedule to reflect that we may need to schedule investments at school sites once decisions have been made around this policy area. Next slide, please. Can I just interject and say yeah. that was also based on feedback that we're hearing, and we're hearing it again at the community meetings we've been to. So I think that's a that's a direct response to community feedback that we've made that that adjustment. Okay, thank you. Um, so now Lucy and I are going to provide some high level updates on um, progress towards goals in 2023. There are more details included in the presentation in the appendix section, if you're interested. Um, but looking first at health and safety um, and looking at school site security, this is an area where we have made some significant investments in 2023. By the fall of 2024, all of our sites will have security locks and remote doorbells installed. In addition, we made upgrades to camera servers and initiated design for new PA system upgrades. Water quality is another area where we have been continuing to make steady investments. In 2023, we completed lead testing in response with state legislation, and we are currently working on the development of a filtered water access policy that we hope to Im begin implementing during the summer of 2024. I'm going to turn it over to Licinia, who's going to give some updates on learning environments in the modernization program. Great. Go ahead. Thank you. So the facilities master plan committed to accelerating improvement in outdoor learning spaces. Um, notably, we've received funding grants from the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission and Cal Fire to leverage our own funds um, and delivered outdoor classroom furniture at over 40 sites. Jointly with our partners in student nutrition services, we've completed nine dining space redesigns last year and are designing and installing kitchen improvements at 10 sites this summer. We have um, in the technology and network improvements area brought three backup generators online and have one more in design. And these really ensure resiliency of our networks in the case of an outage, an electrical outage, our wireless systems would still stay up. Um, and finally, we have focused the, some limited facilities maintenance funds on core functionality projects, allocating over $11 million in fiscal year 24 and prior year carryover funds to roofs, pavement, heat, and other core functionality projects. Next slide. In the modernization program, we have commenced construction at Mission Bay School. We've recently completed subsurface work there and are starting to come out of the ground. We'll be framing later um, this spring. We are completing the design phases at Buena Vista Horace Mann and Denman Middle School with plans to bid those projects next year. And West Porto Elementary School New Buildings Project is out to bid now. Uh, in a few minutes, we'll also talk about the November bond measure currently in development. Okay, thanks. And in terms of our work towards emerging priorities centered around policy directives, um, in 2023, we continue to make investments into our classroom spaces to allow for the offering of universal transitional kindergarten in compliance with state legislation. <clears throat> Sorry, we prepared 13 classrooms for instruction in the 2023-2024 school year. We also completed assessments across 72 classrooms to determine their compatibility for transitional kindergarten program offerings. For affordable housing for educators, we've also made some significant progress here. Um, I think as everyone is aware of, Shirley Chisholm Village is under construction. Applications for that housing opportunity are currently being accepted through Tuesday, April 23rd. Um, 
during the fall and winter, we completed outreach for Shirley Chisholm Village and found a lot of interest from our staff with over 600 staff members registering for our three informational sessions. And we've also made some progress by um, convening a working group to pursue future housing opportunities, which we'll be discussing later in the agenda. Oh, next slide. Thank you. So looking for, oh, actually we can go back one more, thanks. So looking forward, as we think about capital investments in the coming year, we will continue to align our efforts with the um, resource alignment committee to ensure that our resources are efficiently deployed across our school site portfolio. And now, Sonia, do you wanna talk a little bit about the bond? Yes, this is a, um, um, Precursor, what's the right word? I don't know. Um, to the board meeting in May, we'll come back with the um, proposed resolution authorizing placement of a bond on the ballot in November. Um, the bond proposal mirrors the investment categories that we presented to this board last fall in September. Um, and this slide is uh, a more, more of a summary description of the impact the 2024 bond could have if, if uh, um, endorsed by the board and approved by voters in November. The school modernization program would continue uh, with greater commitment to transparency, the moder um, modernization at, at seven school sites and initiate design at an additional five sites. The student nutrition services program is a major feature of the bond, continuing a focus of on-site food preparation and constructing a new central hub for SNS. The bond will also redesign 10 schoolyards, invest significantly in core functionality projects, including building system electrification, continue the pacing of network improvements, and complete the sec security suite work we started in the 2016 program. Next slide. Moving forward, these are three major next steps of facilities initiatives. One, the bond proposal returning to the May 14th board meeting. Um, the second is that we uh, capital planning really under Karen's leadership has defined focus areas for fiscal year 24 and 25 facilities operating funds um, to be centered on these seven items, heat, roofs, windows, pavement, play structures, athletic field safety, and environmental issues. Um, and third, that we have major product projects bidding this year, including West Portal, Denman Middle School, um, the Galileo Bleacher Repair, and PA system improvements at all sites that require upgrades. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, would you like to make a comment before you, it's almost time for you to leave, but we'd love to have you speak before that. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for a lot of the work I saw in here. I can speak personally from somebody who's still in an SFUSD school and has been throughout my entire life that like something as simple as um, having a like survivable classroom in terms of like how warm or cold it is can be the difference between like me going to class and me not going to class. Sorry, mom. Um, but, uh, and also same with PA systems. I, there was a security incident at Denman middle school when there was a lockdown years ago, but my class was in the library and the PA system didn't work in there. So for over 20 minutes, we didn't know that the entire school was actually on lockdown. So things as small as that can be something that could save lives. So I appreciate that. I was curious on one of the slides. Um, it was an infographic. It showed 30 schools turning into 16. And I was curious if that was like just an infographic or if that was accurate information. I don't know if that's your slide yeah. or their slide, but... That was a little alarming. So we we use that as a visual to um, to show how if we had fewer schools, we would have uh, be able to have them more well resourced. But we've gotten that feedback from that came up in one of our community sessions that someone counted and it said uh, said those numbers and thought that we were being literal. So we were gonna we got got a that feedback came after we published this presentation. But got to keep that in mind as we we present. Thanks for. I think it something out. as simple as just like a not accurate to whatever whatever may be helpful. I think I doesn't. I think it says that at the bottom, but I'm not, but it might be very small print, but. Okay. Anyways, thank you very much. Not on that one. So we'll we'll maybe get that on there if we use it again. 
sorry. Um, I forgot I was sharing the meeting <laughs> for a moment. Uh, who else would like to speak, <laughs> Commissioner Bocas? down to go next um thank you for the presentation and all the hard work uh, i think it's it's good to see what's in here it's good to see a commitment to addressing some long-standing issues and problems that the district has faced uh, with our facilities and our ability to kind of make sure our schools reflect learning environments we want students and staff to be in i think the thing that i'm struggling with is it seems to so there seems to be a lack of a larger overarching plan that addresses kind of the large hole that we're in. Like this seems to address what we can do about the issues we're having, but about some of the things that we're having, but it doesn't really address what happens with everything that's untouched, unresolved, and how do we make those communities whole. I also don't get a feeling from this or from any of the conversation that we've had thus far, and maybe the superintendent can address, is how does this relate directly to the direction, the vision for the school district moving forward? And what is the way that this is aligned with the vision, values, goals, and guardrails we have? Because I actually don't see that connection. I didn't see a slide about that in here, which just makes me feel that in some ways, all this good work is great, but it seems very siloed and broken into pieces and is not a part of a collective strategy to address our collective problems. And I think that's a little bit worrying for me as we kind of go about this, knowing that we have to do things in stages, but doing that without a clear goal at the end makes me as a board member feel uncomfortable with the steps that we're taking and our commitment to ensuring equity and doing things in a way um, that really works for all students and not just for a portion of them, especially with the concerns that have come up. So superintendent, if you could address a little bit about how this connects to the broader plan and what type of transparency is really going to be shared with commissioners and the public about how all these things fit together, both timeline, the vision values, goals and guardrails, and just kind of everything that isn't included in this that is urgently needed. Um, yeah, so a few thoughts on that. One is... Um, you know, the facilities master plans identifies, you know, we have way more needs than we have, um, you know, that we'll address in one bond. So um, first, this is why we're going through resource alignment. And part of the one of the questions, one of the points I've shared when we've had this first round of conversations is that, you know, we w are, want to be about providing appropriate educational experiences for our students and not just maintaining buildings for the sake of maintaining buildings. And then I share how, you know, when we have buildings that aren't at capacity and I use, you know, boiler as an example, if it takes half a million dollars to fix a boiler to do it at two schools that are half full, you know, you're spending twice as much to serve the same number of students if our, if our school was at uh, capacity. Um, that's one. The second thing is, I think this is something for us to consider when we, when we, come back at the next meeting is what does our bond program look like, you know, over the next 20 years, not just the next bond, because that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about this level of need. And one of the issues we had is we had a sequence of bonds. And then, you know, our last one was 2016. Um, that's eight years. I can tell you, so that's what I mean. We can be more specific next meeting. Like we can't afford to wait another eight years between, you know, this bond and then a future bond after that. Um, and then I was going to say one other thing. Uh, there was that, that and, and share with the bond. And if the third thing comes back to me. Um, um, oh, well, yeah, I mean, I guess it's related to our to the resource um, allocation, how we're using our resources here to support, um, you know, the kind of buildings we want that again, you know, but really it's about creating those uh, educational experiences for our students. So because I have to think about how that one's integrated into here. Some of it is when we talk about like, uh, you know, providing outdoor learning spaces and uh, classrooms that help facilitate our career pathways and things like that. But I guess you're right; it's not super explicit in the presentation or in our in our even in our facilities master plan. Thank you for that response. And I think oh. just to, go ahead. I'm sorry. sorry. No, I do remember. If we're not clear about it, just the other thing is the the blueprint to what we use our limited resources is laid out. That's why that facilities assessment was so critical that we presented two years ago, because that you get to see, you know, I'm, I'm picturing that chart that has, you know, shows all of our buildings. And remember behind it, each it has a full page, 
that explains the current status of the buildings, but that's that's what guides the the planning and the work. When we know we have a lot of HVAC issues around the the district, we look though how are we addressing where there's the greatest needs, and then uh, making sure that's uh, you know being done equitably throughout the district. That was the thing I was going to say. Thank you for that. Just one more thing. I, I guess I think the concern that I have, and I guess I just want to like publicly register it, it. It feels that our approach to addressing the issues in the district, whether it's facilities or in other places, is we identify a singular problem and we work on a singular solution for it. And that to me feels very troubling and very problematic and doesn't take advantage of the size of the district and kind of our collective energy to resolve some of these issues. And I think as re relating to the facilities master plan, I think what I'm worried about is that when we go through these processes historically, historically communities lose out schools lose out. And I think with us not entering this with a plan to preserve communities, to make a stake of what we value and what's important, really creates a lot of chaos and uncertainty in our school community. And I think we've heard that from the public. And I guess I would just say to you again, I think we need a clear plan and a clear vision of where we're going. And that really needs to be grounded in educational experts like you and the people you've hired, because you are the people who we've hired with expertise to solve these big questions. And I just don't see that here. I see us kind of stumbling through it. And I think it, it's concerning that we aren't going to be as intentional and focused in serving all the communities and the families and students in the way that we need. Thank you. Okay, but I do want you to know what we very much keep in the forefront is when we presented the resource alignment initiative, we had a whole workshop, uh, a discussion on it. And one of the proposed guiding principles here was that, um, where is the proposed guiding? Um, oh, here we go. Sorry. One of the guiding principles is, um, SFUSD will approach the development of any proposed school portfolio changes with an equity lens to explicitly evaluate disproportionate racial equity impacts. This will be consistent, approach will be consistent with state statute best practice and with an understanding of SF, SS history of racial seg segregation. So I know as we've entered this conversation, there's been a lot of skepticism around whether we're going to do that. We've been trying to try to be transparent about how we are. And, um, and, and so know that we keep this, what we talked about as a collective, um, this at the forefront of our processes. And then I'll just say again, I hear what you're saying in the facilities master plan, um, and the approach to the work it's the you're getting more of the data driven around the site the um, facilities so we can uh, I go I just want to think with the team about ways we make sure that that commitment is shown in the facilities master plan as well I guess just in response to that, then I will really quiet is I think being able to define what equity means for us, because I think the statement you said was really passionate. It just doesn't necessarily mean anything. And I, I mean, I think looking even at some of the slides, like I'm looking at slide three, where we listed the places that we've modernized. Like, I don't necessarily know people understand what modernization means for us as a district. Does that mean that that whole building has been fixed and is all brand new top to bottom? or we've addressed some of the key things in the building, but there are sections that still haven't been modernized, right? I think there's a really big disconnect for how we're presenting this and really creating the transparency of understanding that the public needs to understand both where we are and where we need to get to. Let me see if other commissioners have comments or questions. Commissioner Sanchez. And then... Jenny. Okay. Okay, Commissioner Lamb. Thank you. Thank you to the team for the updates. A couple of things. Um, just want to acknowledge and excited to, um, you know, be able to see the pacing. I think that's really, really important for the public, for um, board members to see and um, really thrilled around the affordable housing for our educators, really a key priority um, that this board um, has identified. Um, I'm curious around, and again, my apologies, I did not ask as a pre-question, so happy if staff, you all need more time to get back um, because I recognize I didn't do my due diligence in submitting this before, um, around just really understanding how our um, climate 
and um, environment policies um, overlaid with how we're leading with our facilities master plan, even though they might not currently be called out um, specifically in policy. Um, but I'm very curious around opportunities that are emerging through, both through the state of California, as well as on a national level and how the district has been a leader and want to be able to see, continue to see, um, you know, some considerations that as staff, um, how are we um, adopting those climate policies and thinking um, and, and, you know, being part of our, even our local climate action plan as an example. And again, if you need more time to get back, that's totally fine too. Yeah, I can, I can answer a portion of that question and might need to get back to you with the rest. Um, I guess the first thing I'll say is that the, the existing policies that the district has around, you know, zero net energy, for instance, were um, adopted by, of course, a prior board before we had facility condition data. And that, and so they were visionary and important and that we do strive to achieve them. And also the implementability of those things, I think, is something that we're going to have to grapple with as we get more um, familiar with our the data set that we're actually using and the scopes that we're actually doing in schools. Um, as a counterpoint, though, all of the modernization projects that we're currently proceeding with now, um, since I would say 2022, are fully electric buildings. Like we are not leaving gas boilers in place anymore, which had been a prior practice. And so that is a significant departure from the way that we had been handling modernization projects before. Um, in addition, California's building code has really caught up to this whole notion of energy efficient construction, requiring that in many cases. So it's not as much of a reach for us or for anybody else in California to be doing this work. Um, in terms of like data of how are we doing compared to the district's prior policies, that's stuff that we'll have to, we would have to come back with. So superintendent and to board leadership, um, just for consideration to really, as we continue this work, um, as we are also heading into the bond um, discussions, I do think top of mind for folks are gonna be around that climate and making it more visible, even though we are, been early adopters, I think it'd be important to be able to understand kind of the progress there. And definitely appreciate naming the policy where we're at and the kind of implementation um, realities there too. So I think that will be also important to understand. Um, I want to thank you for the presentation and briefing last week as well. Um, you, we have a $6 billion total need immediately for our facilities throughout the district. Um, and we're floating or planning on floating a bond that's less than a billion of that need. And we have public comment where essentially saying that we're planning on floating a bond that's in today's dollar is you know less than the last bond seven or eight years ago. So um, as candidly as you can, why are why are we not floating a larger bond? Um, and what are the plans or the initial plans for now for the next bond? You were talking about making this, you know, it's a, it's a 20, 30, 40, it's a forever project, obviously, um, because buildings get old always and they always need um, fixing and we need new facilities at times. So what is the reason we're not floating a larger bond or the reasons, the set of reasons, and then what's the plan going forward? Sure, uh, there's three kind of major considerations that we're taking into account, and then we'll have a final number, obviously, to prepare to 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 share. But the reason why um, already we're we're feeling like this is not going to be a billion dollar plus bond. So one consideration is real desire to keep the tax burden the same on the community, right? So the way it works is bonds fall off and then new bonds come on. And we've been working with the controller's office to find the right number where they can actually attest to the fact that yes, you're not increasing the tax base. Um, number two is looking at our ability to spend bond funds. We only have so much capacity to, to be able to spend the funds. And so if you actually get 
uh, do too large of a bond that you don't move on, we lose, uh, uh, I don't know, the technical, uh, right? But we, what, what do we lose? We lose... We would be at risk of losing the tax exempt status of the bond if we don't spend it fast enough. Right. So we got to uh, time, uh, uh, time that. And then third, you know, frankly, we're in a position where we need to, uh, we've talked about, we need to demonstrate the com to the community our ability to manage our resources well. And it's unfortunate that they get uh, conflated because the bond program has been managed very well and that, um, you know, ha hasn't submitted a qualified budget or have had FICMAT come in and make, uh, you know, assessments around it. But, but you know, it's just uh, seen overall, um, the confidence in the district's ability is one we're needing to restore. And so, frankly, that's a factor we're considering as well. It's like looking, we're doing a lot to get a lot, you know, aligned to our goals and guardrails to use our resource as well. And so that's another consideration. So I think, again, hearing when we come back at the next meeting, though, putting that in context, that's why in four years, it'd still be a meaningful amount of funding to spend in four years to do projects if that's the timeline we decide we want to go on, uh, you know, four to six years. So we can talk about that at the next meeting as well. Okay, thank you. And just one more, um, just focusing on the security aspect of this future bond, it talks about a PA system, making sure that all the schools have adequate PA systems. Um, and I think, and also surveillance cameras, if that's what we want to call them, um, the cameras that are in our schools. And I don't know about your experience at June Jordan, but my experience at Cleveland was when we um, needed to review film footage of things that went wrong or awry or sideways at our school. The quality was so lackluster that it was actually useless footage to be able to get any resolution to the issue at hand. So, so, and I say that because traditionally, in the past, not traditionally, but at times in the past, we have gone out to the lowest bidder and we've gotten really faulty or inadequate, um, you know, bang for the buck. So I'm just wondering if you can comment on the how good of the systems we're going to have. Because the PA system, we had a brand new PA system as well through a bond, the, the previous bond at Cleveland. It didn't work at all. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the or maybe not, maybe you can't talk about it now, but you can inform us later, but about the quality of the, the type of security systems that we're going to have moving forward. Sure. So both the PA system and, well, let me let me speak in the wheelhouse I know, which is the PA system. The security cameras are not, um, not always bond-funded investments, and though we do that in new construction, but really uh, the emergency preparedness office handles security cameras typically. So I don't actually know a lot about the district standard for that piece of equipment, but can provide that later. The PA system, we actually have a new district standard that came out of um, the sort of revisiting process we did when the funds were allocated by the board in 2021. Um, really the need and the cause for PA system and what we're trying to do in schools has really changed from when PA systems, you know, when some of us were younger and PA systems were really for like the student council president to announce, you know, what was happening that week, right? It wasn't to announce potentially school lockdown, for instance. And so when you hear kind of anecdotal stories of like, well, it doesn't work in the gym or it didn't work in the library, that was actually by design, right? Because we didn't want to interrupt quiet spaces or collective spaces with all school announcements about the bake sale on Thursday. Now we're in a much of a different scenario where we want to tell more people more things about what's going on to make sure that in an emergency scenario, everybody is informed. And that is actually a departure and a change to the district standard PA coverage um, from what was previously in the district standard. Uh, and that's important, right? Because it's not that those systems that were that are in those schools weren't functioning as designed. They are. They just the need has changed and evolved over time. So when we looked at that, we also looked at the piece of equipment. And to your point about low bid, we are required to comply with public contract code, which for most things requires a low bid scenario. Um, and also the district has the right through the public contracting code to make a sole source choice if there's a substantial reason for that. And so in the case of the PA system and some other things, we have elect made that election to declare something a district standard that is, you know, has a full kind of part number that goes along with it, right? So it is this exact thing is what we're asking for, not not or like 
or substitute. It is this exact thing. And so we, to do that, the new piece of equipment that we worked with, you know, if, if there's any vendors that can supply this, let us know this kind of procurement process, right? Um, we, we have brought somebody in to demonstrate to us what their thing could do. And that's the one we picked. And so everyone's going to put that one in. Is that okay? <laughs> so we feel pretty confident in the PA and it's also now covering all spaces, including outdoor spaces um, and corridors and all the other places that didn't weren't covered before. Thank you very much for this presentation and all this work um, going back to the facilities analysis. I mean, it's been a Herculean effort over the past couple of years. So thank you to get us to the point where we have real data to be able to make real decisions. This is um, this is very, very helpful. So thank you. Um, we heard a lot in public comment um, about the need to build trust, transparency, accountability, equity, and community engagement. It's our job as commissioners to reflect the values of the community. I heard that all tonight, let alone at all the community meetings we've been holding over the past couple of weeks. Um, um, so in building on a couple other comments, uh, our job is also to center students and their outcomes rather than the budgets in the buildings. And I know we can't get strong student outcomes if we don't have healthy buildings. Um, and so I, I agree. I'm, as we go through the resource alignment process, I think there's a, it, at the same time as we're going out for a bond and and I, I hope that there'll be a this continued level of transparency and accountability as we move forward. My briefing last week was actually really helpful in understanding this whole process and the intricacies. So I thank you very much for that. Um, looking through the the information, um, the, I'm looking particularly at slide four um, and our emerging priorities. And my questions really um, are on the policy directives of zone-based student assignment and portfolio management. Portfolio management, let's put a pin in that because that's related to other things. But back in 2018, when we passed our resolution to move towards zone-based student assignment and then shelved that, the one of the big reasons it was paused was equity, right? We we couldn't develop zones that had all of our language pathways and all of our special education pathways or took into account that some school buildings needed a whole lot more work and it wasn't fair to to take schools that that hadn't been modernized in one area and compare those to and leave folks out of zones in another area so i we we haven't addressed those issues that led us to shelf the zone based student assignment system yet so i think for me I'm I'm wondering, help me understand how we're at a point when we had to shelve it a couple of years ago and now we think when we actually have a guardrail around equity, how we can bring that back and what we've done to change that and make that acceptable now. Um, yeah, so we're, we're actually bringing that back where, as we bring forward our new portfolio in the sense that we're, we recognize the Board of Education approved this policy and so it, it, and it, actually, at the same workshop I was talking about on on August 28th, we had talked about um, the, and a few commissioners pointed out, the need to really make sure when we're bringing forward our portfolio, our attendance policy or how we're implementing our updated attendance policy is clear. So that's going to come back with the proposed new portfolio. And so you are speaking, there were in the first round of of you know trying to create zones there were some you know issues and questions that that came up and then with the pandemic it, you know my understanding it got paused but then we are we're, we're figuring out how to address those and so we are bringing it bringing it uh including enrollment and in what we bring forward uh, so we are 
we are undergoing a holistic review. One of the other things that we've heard from public commenters at this board, how inequitable it feels for some schools in the south side of the city to have buses, SFUSD buses, show up outside of their school and have their students from their neighborhoods bus to West Portal for language pathways, and not to mention the environmental impacts. Um, all, so that's to Commissioner Bogus's point about defining equity. That would be very anti-equity. So these are the things that if we are going to be looking at as part of this facilities master plan, zone-based student assignment as an emerging priority, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to fix some of our historic problems before we get to a point where it's anything that will be acceptable to community or me as a commissioner. I just want to name that here and now. Yeah, and uh, you're right. There's a lot of work ahead of us, but you're absolutely right about it needing to be uh, looked at holistically. And again, I think that's been the, the board's message that we're not discussing transportation, our enrollment policy, the state of our facilities, um, where our language programs are and special education programs. Like if that's not all being taken into consideration, um, we're really going to be presenting a, a school portfolio and a plan that isn't going to address all the needs. So we're trying to get it all and not trying. We need to get it all in what we bring forward. Okay. Um, thanks so much to my fellow commissioners for your comments. Um, and clearly we still have a lot uh, of work to do, but this is a great update. Um, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So we will move forward with, <laughs> thank you. Yes. Thank you <laughs> both. Um, we will move forward with our action items, uh, section H. Um, so we have, um, three, uh, votes to take right now. The first one is approval of resolution number 24416SP1 and resolution number 24416SP2, declaring the properties at 1627th Avenue and 95 Gough Street as exempt surplus land for the purpose of housing for district educators and employees. Can I have a motion and a second on these two resolutions, please? So moved. Second. Thank you. Are there... Um, do you, no, so uh, I was going to say we we don't have an attached presentation, and actually, what you read is pretty much is pretty straightforward. So we'll just turn it over to you if you have questions um, uh, uh, for us. And I think there is a presentation. Oh yeah, there is a presentation, too. but but we can, don't need to. Yeah, yeah, it's more for informational purposes. Unless people are interested, I'm happy to go. Through so that. are there any questions or comments from board commissioners on H one? I just wanted to confirm on the included presentation on slide two that all of the properties that are controlled, owned, or managed by the district are included, um, I guess, in that representative number and in the chart? Yes, that should include, <clears throat> it should include all properties that are owned by the district. Yes. So, sure. Thank you. Okay. And so I think I appreciate the work. I definitely appreciate the effort to um, address the and affordability of housing for staff uh, within the city of San Francisco and really trying to find a way to um, figure out what small steps we can take to address the problem. I think the concern that I have is less with the work that was done for this particular these particular resolutions or these properties, but just the lack of what I feel like is a more larger coherent plan about how these types of activities fit into a broader strategy around teacher retention, teacher recruitment, any of the things that we're kind of focused on. Um, it just seems to, to not be here. It feels very much that these are good efforts that are happening in isolation from a broader plan or strategy to address um, some of the concerns I think that these um, hopeful housing developments would would address for us. And, and so I, for me, it, it creates a lot of concern, um, just that there isn't that clarity, that full transparency, 
Um, or even, I think for me, it's the clearance that the district has a long-term plan and strategy about how we manage kind of the portfolio of places we want to develop and kind of where that begins and ends. I mean, would really have loved to see that included uh, with these resolutions um, and even with the presentation, I'm um, just we moves forward. So I just wanted to, to share my concerns um, and challenges uh, with supporting uh, these resolutions. Are there other comments? Yeah. Or? Oh, and I can oh, respond. Man. One thing to Sorry. respond to that. Thanks for sharing that. And I will definitely incorporate that feedback as we move forward. Um, but one thing that I did want to say is the community input has really informed where we've gotten to this point. And it will really continue to inform our next steps. And if there's broader outreach that we should be doing, um, we will absolutely look to see who else we should be talking to and incorporating that feedback into the plan. Um, the plan itself in developing a strategy, we started the process by assembling a housing working group that's comprised of community members with expertise in housing, um, affordable housing, affordable housing policy, our labor partners. And so throughout this process, we've really been trying to communicate as much as we can with different internal and external stakeholders, realizing that as a school district, we are not housers. And so we're really relying on the community to help us with technical assistance and help us develop a viable plan. Um, but I think if there are others who we should in be including or more outreach we should be doing, we are certainly open to it. And we'll like think about that as well. Thank you for that. And I definitely think it's good to incorporate community voice and impacted folks in the planning. I think what I'm more talking about is where's the district's overall strategy and leadership to kind of guide those processes. I, in my experience, we do a lot of community engagement. We don't typically get the same response from everyone and we end up having to make decisions. And so I feel like it'd be helpful to start with what is our commitment to housing our educators and to ensuring that we have representation of housing across the city, or if that isn't a priority to to just be, I think, really transparent. I think for me, there is a high level plan and focus that isn't here. And I think it makes, at least for me, feel that we don't have a clear long-term vision of how all these different pieces fit together. And we're really piecemealing our strategy and approach. And so I, I really feel like that's problematic. And hopefully as more of these conversations come, we can, can hopefully see a shift or see more clarity and transparency of all the good work that maybe addresses some of these concerns. Commissioner Fisher. Yeah, I appreciate Commissioner Bogus's questions. I have some very similar ones. I mean, I appreciate this work. I'm super excited about more housing. It's it's more the timing of it. And um my my questions are specifically around the timing and the community, the timing and community outreach on slide five. Timing, we have Shirley Chisholm, Shirley Chisholm Housing coming online, you know, which is our first pilot, our first shining beacon here. I, to Commissioner Bogus's point, there's a lot of unknowns here. Um, you know, and one of the big questions I'm hearing from community is how many educators are actually going to get space at Shirley Chisholm? Because anyone can technically apply, right? So, no. No, it is all teacher. Okay, there are a lot. There is. It's sixty forty, or at least that was the original plan. Sixty percent for teachers, and well, originally when it was negotiated, and forty percent for para or folks in para, para positions. Hundred percent, hundred percent staff. Okay, because I think then we might need to be. I've had a lot of questions from community about how are we making sure that it's just going to be educators who get yeah, this housing. It is so. Yeah, and okay. I could clarify just. Um, quickly. So the there's a tiered system and tier one is educators. Tier two is any other district employee. Tier three is the general public. Right now we have a lottery ongoing and that is just for SFUSD employees. We've received, um, we have applications that we will receive through next Tuesday. We will, the mayor's office of housing and community, community development will administer that lottery. In the fall, we will have another lottery that will be open to the general public, but their applications will be sorted according to the tiers. And so our hope is that, and what we have seen is that we will have demand in excess of the 134 units. And so as long as that preference is, you know, applied, which it will be, the goal is that all units will go to SFUSD educators. It is true if our wait if we went through our wait list and didn't have um, enough educators on the wait list, it would be open to the general public because of fair housing laws, which we do have to comply with. 
that's my point right there. There's a lot of ifs. There's a lot of assuming everything goes to plan, the demand, right? The demand exceeds the, the right. My point being, before it. we build more housing, wouldn't it make sense to make sure that this one works out well and we do, like, why? I, I get, and have a fully formed plan with moving forward. I'm not opposed to more educator housing. I don't mean to make, I, we need more educator housing. To me, I'm just concerned about the timing of building more before we, as with everything, we want to see that our original model works before we we do more and end up with the same problems. Yeah, right? and I think I really, I completely agree with what you're saying. And we are, before we pursue another project, we are absolutely going to be looking at the data from this lottery, which will be hugely valuable to see who applied what their income levels were and where there's gaps. We're also administering a housing survey starting this week that will go more in depth. It will be sent to all employees and it will go a lot more in depth into what our staff's housing preferences. And all of that information will inform our next steps. Um, these resolutions are coming to the board now because there is a significant wait period for this waiver to be approved. And so our hope is that we will submit this waiver um, to the State Board of Education, but it likely won't be reviewed until September or November. Within that period, we will be talking to community members, developing the goals of the RFP. And if it turns out that this isn't meeting staff's needs, we will be transparent about that information and adapt for sure. So where are our inflection points in the process where we can adapt and pivot if we have to? I would say right now, at any point, we've made no commitments. We're just identifying these properties and exploring feasibility. Okay, so that's what we're. Um, so the other point that I would that I was making before was uh, slide five community outreach. When was this discussed at DAC? I've been attending all the DAC meetings. Um, I haven't heard this come up. Was this early last year or? Yeah, it was at the January eighth meeting. Okay. Um, Okay, um, this is these projects could have significant. So again, yay, educator housing. We need it. Just making sure that, to Commissioner Bogus's point, we have a fully formed strategy, and we know what we're we're working on. I and to the community's point of trust, transparency, accountability, equity, and community engagement. I really think we have a lot more work to do here. Recognizing this is the first step but we have a lot more work to do. Um, two things. One is just in, I mean, maybe, it, I don't know that I saw this in the in the presentation, maybe, but I mean, this is a project, this is a five-year project, right? Um, yeah, so, so we can make sure that that's clear, right? That, so we'll have all this information from how Shirley Chilson worked out before we really even, you know, engage in anything because, um, because of the timing. So this is just the first step in that. Secondly, um, again, here, you know, one of the, the other things when we've talked about resource alignment and where the board gave direction as well was that if we're, if our properties are not going to be schools, that the priority is educator housing as well as that they're being used for community benefit. So one of Karen's tasks is that as we're going through the portfolio um, discussion and talking about having fewer schools to be working with um, other departments and our community partners of identifying what might be some ways in which we provide, uh, use our buildings for community benefits. So an example I've given, so we don't have things lined up, but we know it's, it's again, part of our task of what we need to do. But an example I've given is you all probably have seen emails too. Like we get a lot of requests to use our spaces over summer for summer camp and then, you know, after school programs, but that's our time to clean spaces. So there, you know, if we could have a space, uh, if, if there's community, that would be an example of community benefit or, we're going to be doing a lot more modernization and construction. We don't have a site that's easy to move people to. You, we've heard that here uh, as well. So we are looking at uh, when we bring forward our new portfolio. What um, you know? What's our what's our approach to fulfill what we think are the broad mandates around community benefit, which does specifically include educator housing. So it sounds like just to kind of confirm that point that. As some of my colleagues are asking for a more detailed plan, that that may also be forthcoming as we come through the resource alignment process, that like this map on slide two, 
we might have, there might be another version that's saying kind of, okay, here's places that we're thinking might be used for housing. Here's places we might be used for community benefits, swing space, various, you know, as we, as we free up uh, space based on potential school mergers. Is that fair to say? Yes. And I appreciate the way you're saying it because I want to be manage expectations in that the expectation I have is we've identified some potential partners or some ways it could be used. We're not going to be bringing forward, you know, in December, here's leases for right. 10, 10 buildings, but it can't also just be, we have these vague ideas right. about community uh, benefit. Like there needs to be some specific partnerships that we're pursuing um, or ideas about, yeah, what, which site would be used for what type of partnership that we would want to bring forward. Commissioner Lamb. Can I just ask one, just, sorry. Okay. I, I Can think I go to just the one thing that would help me is a timeline of like understanding the timeline here of, of, you know, now that we're, you know, assuming we vote yes on this today, what does the timeline look from now until we have housing built on the site? And what are the steps? So Commissioner Lamb and then uh, Commissioner Weiss Moore. Thank you. Um, I wanted to make sure that we stay in the agenda around district housing. So thank you, Superintendent talked about the community benefits, because certainly that's something I've been raising about um, when we look at our whole portfolio. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge around the district housing aspects. These aren't current buildings. These have been underdeveloped parcels that have been sitting there for I don't know how many decades. I mean, the pumpkin patch, 7th and Lawton, has been analyzed, I don't know for how long. And the fact that it took 15 years to even build Sir Shirley Chisholm, and the fact that our neighbors in the next region over was able to build educator housing in 18 months. And we have identified time and time again, working conditions, living in affordability is so critical to both recruiting and retaining. And so I know my colleagues aren't saying questioning around the district housing, but I feel so committed and passionate about this because every day that goes by without us accelerating district housing, our educator and staff housing is a day loss potentially for the recruitment and retainment of our, our quality staff. So, um, and the other aspect I think that we learned through this process and certainly the staff are the true experts here um, is the deep partnership with the city. The reality around our goals and our outcomes, student outcomes goals, means we have to be so focused with our assets, which are our staff, what happens in the classrooms with our students and, and their connection to our school communities, that I think we've learned a lot to be able to partner with our, you know, currently our current developer, as well as working with the city on leveraging those um, of those expertise of those partners. So I think that's something that, um, is going to be continue to be critical. And I just want to thank the team who've done the engagement with the partnerships, being able to look at, you know, the challenging of the financing that makes it happen and how volatile it has been, which has been part of the challenge over the years of, of um, you know, securing um, Shirley Chisholm. And so I just wanted to at least weigh in there about um, the acceleration and why it's so important for um, um, just ed overall educator and staff housing. Thank you, thank you. Um, I just wanna share what I, I think is a different perspective from maybe some of my colleagues, certainly the colleague closest to my right in terms of the, the perspective on whether there's a vision here. And I actually really appreciated slide six. And I, I, I guess my perspective is different in that I have heard community educators and district leadership consistently talk about the importance of housing. Um, I've seen that. I've I've heard the connection to wanting to make sure our teachers are here, are happy, are are we can recruit and we can we can retain because that matters for our students. So I have heard that. Um, may, maybe there might be you know more slides, although I don't think more slides is necessarily beneficial for for the for all of us all the time. But I just want to say that I do. I have a with all due respect, I do have a different perspective where I think that. Um, there has been a uh, consistent and coherent discussion around as of late around housing and the importance of it and its connection to our educators and our our students in our community. So I want to thank you for that. And I I guess to to 
Commissioner Lamb's point. I also agree that I, I it, there has got to be momentum. Now we don't want to go crazy and make decisions that we're going to regret. But you know, having a pause for another two years to to then make the next step doesn't seem to be what anyone's asking for. And I think we are under some very um, urgent and and um, time pressured needs to to be able to get more affordable housing in the city for our educators. And so I appreciate these steps that you're taking and I appreciate um, your flagging that there are going to be these inflection points and we're gonna be really intentional to look at the data, to look at how did things go and might we need to pivot or make different decisions moving forward. So thank you. All right, I'm gonna call for a roll call vote. Commissioner Bogus. No. Commissioner Fisher. Yes, Commissioner share Lamb. a timeline. Yes. Commissioner Sanchez. Yes. Commissioner Wiseman Ward. Uh, uh, we, roll call we, vote on the item. Yes. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> Vice President Alexander. Yes. That's five eyes. It passes. All right, thank you. The next item, H2, is um, item 244-16SP4, the California Voting Rights Act. CVRA resolution. Um, Superintendent Wayne, do you have staff to come on it? Um, well, I can assure you, this is a, a resolution we passed. Uh, a, the Board of Education passed a previous resolution to be um, in compliance, agreeing to take the necessary steps to be in compliance with the Civil Rights Voting Act. And um, one of the steps is determining whether there is racially polarized voting that's occurring in the district. And so uh, this resolution gives us authorization to move forward with um, a demographer to engage in that study. And also we note in it that uh, we would be moving forward in partnership with the um, City College of San Francisco because uh, they're facing a similar um, question, and so uh, we'll we'll engage in this together. All right, and may I have a motion and a second, please? So moved. Second. All right. Are there any um, comments or questions from board members? Seeing none, let's have a roll call vote. Thank you, Commissioner Bogus. Yes. Commissioner Fisher. Yes. Commissioner Lim. Yes. Commissioner Sanchez. Yes. Commissioner Wasman Ward. Yes. Vice President Alexander. Yes. Six eyes passes. All right. Thank you. Um, item H3 is 244-16 SP5, tentative agreement between San Francisco Unified School District and United Administrators of San Francisco regarding reopener successor agreement and required AB 1200 disclosures. Can I have a motion and a second, please? So moved. Second. All right. Uh, Superintendent Wayne. Uh, yes, the as noted in the agenda item title, this is a required reopener having reached um, agreement with other labor partners, uh, particularly UASF, we're required to then uh, re meet with UASF and um, determine what might be appropriate compensation to support our goals for recruiting and retaining. So we're bringing this forward and this was part of our budget plan that we presented when presenting overall uh, approach, uh, our approach to salary increases. Thank you. Are there any comments or questions from the board? Seeing none, we'll have a roll call vote. Thank you. Commissioner Bogus? Yes. Commissioner Fisher? Yes. Commissioner Lamb? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Wiseman Ward? Yes. Vice President Alexander? Yes. Six eyes, it passes. Thank you. All right, moving on to item I, public hearing regarding educator housing. Uh, I now open the public hearing on the resolution number 244-16SP3, authorizing the submission of a waiver to the State Board of Education to utilize a request for proposals process to consider proposals for the development of housing for district employees on the properties at 1627th Avenue and 95 Gough Street. Uh, Superintendent Wayne. Yeah, so you just uh, approved the resolution that makes these properties eligible for development of teacher housing. Just to be clear, what we're asking here is a waiver to allow us to do requests for proposals instead of requests for bids. And the reason we want this waiver is a request for bids require us to only do the go move forward with the lowest 
um, bid. And since we're wanting to use uh, to develop this as educator housing and work with a partner who's going to work with us to get uh, make sure that the, the property is developed appropriately, we want to do requests for proposals. So that's what this. Uh, so right now, you, and, and when we ask for these types of waivers, we need to have a public hearing. So that presents what it is. So now uh, I'll turn it to you to open for public comment, and then you'll actually vote on it after you have the public hearing. Not yet, because we're right now. Uh, someone asked if it needed to be moved. Right now, it's in, but we don't, because right now we're having the public hearing, um, and then in item J, uh, we will actually do the vote on this item. So um, now it is time for public comment on item I, which is the, essentially the same as item J. So this is the opportunity if there's members of the public who would want to comment on resolution two four four one six SP three, um, authorizing. Uh, us to submit a waiver to the State Board of Ed um, to utilize a request for proposals process uh, to consider proposals for the development of housing for district employees at um, 1627th Avenue, aka the Pumpkin Patch and 95 Gough Street. Um, so if anyone would like to make public comment, are there any in person, uh, Mr. Steele? I did not receive any uh, public comment cards for this item in person. Okay, let's see if there's any online. Do you see one hand uh, raised online? And just a reminder, again, this is a um, regarding, it's a public hearing regarding educator housing. So um, you'll have one minute to speak. Can we please have that repeated in Spanish and Chinese? Estamos tomando ahora comentarios públicos acerca de el punto de la vivienda para los maestros. La tenía el derecho de hablar por un minuto. Muchas gracias. Anthony. Acá yo acabo de decir que yo le digo, um, 那個教育者那個房屋那個條款呢作這個公眾發言的話呢而家可以網上舉手啦每人有一分鐘的時間嘅唔該thank you thank you so I see Vanessa Virginia and Sarah Vanessa go ahead please thank you can you hear me yes um, thanks. I this is Vanessa from Parents of Public Schools of San Francisco. I wanted to want to appreciate SFUSD's prior leadership and board for the work that they've done um, to actually make Shirley Chisholm a reality. There are plenty of educators in the Bay Area that cannot afford to live where they practice, and it's really nice that that will become a reality in San Francisco. My hope is that as um, housing is rolled out, that it remains for educators. Lots of concerns coming through parents of public schools about who will be able to reside in Shirley Chisholm. So I really would like you all to be very thorough and make sure that it goes to the intended populations. Thank you. Thank you. Virginia. Oh, thank you, sister. Uh, to the board and uh, Superintendent Wayne and and the awesome, awesome student delegate, I support this uh this uh this uh, agenda item. Public uh, educator housing is long overdue. Uh, for mostly thirty years of my thirty six years with SFUSD, you've been talking about uh teacher housing, including nineteen fifty Mission Street, the current Dine Feinstein, and on and on and on. Our neighbors in Coma built their uh, built their public how built their teacher education housing made the national news and we we're still talking about Shirley Chisholm. So with all haste, I was, I'm sure the neighbors will hate to lose their pumpkin patch uh, on Seventh Avenue, but they can find another location. So I would encourage you to build uh, simultaneously housing, housing, housing for teachers and make and make it always, always for teachers only. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marshall. Sarah? Hi, my name is Sarah Meskin. I'm a public school parent in SFUSD, and I also am a teacher um, in JUHSD. Um, about two years ago, we were able to implement staff housing, and I just want to say that it has been like a game changer. Um, you know, we're a very historically underfunded district. I was used to starting out the year with tons of vacancies at our site and throughout the district. Um, and since the staff housing has been implemented, 
We have started out the year almost fully staffed, and it's been a game changer for the teachers. It's been a game changer for the students, and it's been a game changer for the entire district. Um, I just can't say enough good things about it. Um, and I agree that it's long overdue um, in a city like San Francisco, where rent and cost of living is so high. And so I support this um, wholeheartedly. Um, and I really, really hope that we can get this through as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. That does conclude our uh, virtual public comment for um, this item. All right, uh, then um, are there any comments from the board uh, on this or do we save our comments for the next part? Yeah, actually just close the public okay. hearing. And then save this, okay. So I will now close the public hearing um, regarding resolution number 24416SP3. And then we will move to item J at which we will consider the same resolution. Um, again, authorizing the submission of a waiver to the State Board of Ed to utilize the request for proposals process to consider proposals for the development of housing for district employees on the properties at 1627th Avenue and 95 Gloss Street. Can I have a motion and a second, please? So moved. Second. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, did you have other comments, Superintendent Wayne, or should we open? Okay. So let's open it up for board comments or questions. If there are any, pardon? Do we have to do the public hearing and the public comment for this as well, or was no? That's the what last that was. One, so we we had the public it. hearing okay. on the same item. We now closed so it, and now got it. Okay. Yeah, and now we're um, yeah. Thank you for the clarification. Did Did anyone have comments? Okay, well, let's move on to a roll call vote then. Commissioner Bogus, yes. Commissioner Fisher, yes. Commissioner Lamb. Yes. Commissioner Sanchez. Yes. Commissioner Wiseman Ward. Yes. Vice President Alexander. Yes. Six eyes passes. Um, wonderful. All right. Um, we're now going to move on to item K1, um, guardrail one, effective decision making. And I'll ask Superintendent Wayne if this item will take more than three minutes. It probably will, right? You don't comment, but uh, then I think maybe maybe we should um, extend the meeting. I think we should vote to see if we can extend the meeting past ten. It won't be long past ten, I hope, but um, I think we should probably do that if people are okay with that. So moved. There need to be a motion in a second on the the request to um, yes yes. Okay. So I, I move to extend the meeting past ten. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Commissioner Bogus. Uh, to move the um, meeting past 10 o'clock. Yes. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Fisher. Uh, yes. Commissioner Lamb. Yes. Commissioner Sanchez. Yes. Commissioner Wasman Ward. Yes. <laughs> Vice President Alexander. Uh, yes. Success. Okay. All right. Superintendent Wayne, Wayne item K. Yes, so um, thank you. We wanted to just bring this back for a discussion to close the loop on the work that's been happening since our progress monitoring report on February 27th. Um, you may recall we presented our, our progress monitoring report on guard rail one. And uh, while the board accepted the monitoring report, they gave feedback on how guard rail one is being interpreted. And we talked in, including with our coach from the uh, Council of Great City Schools, uh, the guardrails are a bit more challenging than the goals to identify the inner metrics because there are my the superintendent's interpretation of how um, to show progress towards meeting that guardrail. And whereas when we're talking about the goals, the goals are already in measurable terms. So it's easy to identify benchmarks along the way. The guardrails aren't aren't presented in measurable terms. So that's what we're trying to, to um, uh, determine. So since then, uh, I've been working with board leadership um, and another district leadership really to address, I think, um, you know, three major issues. So defining what a major decision is, ensuring there is a shared understanding of meaningful consultation, and identifying metrics that reflect this under uh, understanding. So uh, the next slide shows the, the guardrail. So we're actually leaving the guardrail intact. But if you go to the following slide, you see basically, you know, really meaningfully changing the um, um, the uh, interim measures that we would use to monitor progress towards that. And the feedback, um, you know, what we discussed is, you know, how do we know that the consultation has been meaningful? 
um, the Board of Education offered some examples of previous processes they'd, they'd gone through for the superintendent search and the vision, values, goals, and guardrails. So we looked at that as a baseline, because remember, in this, to have a SMART goal, you need to have, you're going from something to something. And then really um, tried to establish some metrics that, that demonstrates a meaningful growth in uh, consulting with our parents, guardians, and stakeholders. So that's what there is on slide four. And slide five is, you know, trying to be a little bit more precise about what we mean by um, a major decision, you know, that it impacts at least 25% of students and 25% of schools, and is not part of our routine operations of the district. I think that's the, you know, a key distinguisher. But even with that, felt like it's important for us to have a shared um, understanding agreement. And as the year's coming up, you know, what are going to be the major decisions we can tackle? And we can see from the resource alignment, like, you know, we got 10,000 surveys. That's the most we've gotten, you know, I think forever and ever in, in terms of trying to get input. The amount of work it takes to get to that, it's worth it, but that needs to, you know, that can really be for one or two decisions a year. Knowing that with this guardrail is also meant to, you know, do what we say the student outcomes focused governance work do is shift the culture so that even if something's not a major decision, there's an understanding that we're consulting those will be impacted and and going through that process. But um, what we thought would be a time to bring it forward is the LCAP and budget is when we talk about here's what you can expect from the coming year to also name the the major decisions that we would address and have that be part of that presentation. It wouldn't be necessarily in the LCAP, but that seems the right time to bring forward what the two would be. So those are the proposed revisions. And I'll just I'll just add, and again, I don't know if this totally represents President Matamidi's view, but we've been collaborating closely on this. Um, so, but from my point of view, um, I, you know, just in terms of the process, the point of the guardrail is really it's holding the superintendent accountable to um, our values, right? It's saying make sure you you're you're um, moving toward the goals in line with our values. And it was clear that there was somewhat of a mismatch in our, our collective understanding between our understanding as a board and the superintendent's understanding when it, at this last monitoring report. And so a natural response to that might be to revise the guardrail and make it more specific and directive, which you know we worked on and it, we were really struggling with how to do that. I think we we can still do it if that's where the board ends up going, but we felt like this may be a better approach since the superintendent said, hey, you know, I think perhaps these revisions of the of the interims re reflect the will of the board and can kind of reflect a, at least from my and at least from my point of view, they do. They reflect a better kind of mutual understanding and collective understanding of what now that guardrail means. So I think that's the so this is more of rather than a, a, a vote, this is just a discussion item to sort of check check that understanding with the whole board and say, hey, does that make sense? Understanding that if if we move forward and you know it still seems disconnected, we always have the option of going back and revising the guardrail still, right? So but that so we but we're kind of President Matamani and I are proposing sort of an interim step here in collaboration with the superintendent that, that perhaps this clarification is is sufficient. So that's kind of what we want to open up for feedback on. Mr. Fisher. I appreciate the work that went into this. So thank you, President Matamidi, who's not here, and Vice President Alexander and staff who worked with you on this. So um, to me, and I mean this with all respect, this still misses the mark. For me, my biggest issue, really, what I've been asking for since before I joined the board, but as a member of someone as the team that now reflects the values of the community, I'm still asking for an overarching community engagement strategy. We don't have that. And I don't think we can measure the how we reflect the community's values in this whole process in two or four major decisions the, the, the district makes. We keep saying over and over again, you know, that people coming to the board and standing here at the podium, that's not the way to engage with us, right? That's one way, that's not dialogue. Yet because our community members have no other means to engage with us, they keep doing it. Tonight was a perfect example. We had an 
hour and a half of public comment about everything from personnel matters to bond funding to schools that need upgrades to closing small schools by design. Like we need other places for people to come talk to us and discuss this kind of stuff. It can't be here at the board. So this is to me what this guard, like how are we engaging with the community on the regular, not just a couple major decisions. That's to me what this guardrail should address, absolutely should address and doesn't. Um, so, I mean, we can't measure everything, but our job first and foremost, our job as commissioners, if we're looking at the student out outcomes focused governance process is to reflect the values of the community. We can't do it when they're here at the podium. We're not getting the full, we, we need a better way to do it. We're not hearing what, you know, the other one that I, I keep hearing about is, well, um, you know, we've got um, student link line. We don't see any of that. We we don't. Um, where we hear from our advisory committees, we as a board hear from our community advise, uh, advisory committees once. We used to hear from them multiple times a year. Even that has been shut down as a means of connecting with us. I, I feel like this is further and further missing the mark. And what I would respectfully suggest is that we have a committee that discusses this oh, just from community engagement as a, as a whole strategy, because I think we are failing as a board in our commitment to hear from the community. We started community engagement sessions. Six people were showing up at those at a maximum, right? We're, We've got to figure out the overarching strategy about how we as a board want to hear from the community, as well as what is the superintendent and his leadership team's opportunity. This this is a great start, but like I said, totally misses the mark. Let's give, can we give the superintendent a chance to, oh, you want? Yeah, she can. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Commissioner West, my word, and then. Um, thank you. Also want to start by echoing the thanks to um, board leadership um, and Superintendent Wayne, in terms of, I know that my sense is that there probably was a lot of conversation around how to rethink um, Gardner One and, and specifically how to define a major decision. So I I think this, this does capture, I think, what the goal of guardrail and defining a major decision is. So I fully support this. To my colleague's point about community engagement, I don't disagree. I just, I, I actually, I think it's a separate conversation. So I don't see it as missing the mark. I see this being exactly what we were looking for when we had that first conversation. I also think that we are conflating that 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 what is guardrail one and making a major decision and the very, very important issues that you come up, which is what is community engagement on the regular. So um, I, I wanna make sure that we don't conflate the two, And but I, and, I think that we need to continue to find the space to figure out what does meaningful community engagement look like because we haven't figured that out. I agree. Uh, let's go with Commissioner Sanchez, uh, Commissioner Bogus. Um, Did you want to check? I agree with you, uh, Commissioner Wiseman Ward. I do think that I agree with the refining of this guardrail. I'm supportive, um, but I do think we need a strategy around engaging our community better. And I encourage board leadership to appoint and convene an ad hoc committee that will tackle that issue, because that's really the only way I think we can get that done in a, in, in a public fashion so that we can ensure that we have something going forward that will align with this process uh, for um, our guardrail here. I also want to give um, thanks and appreciation to board leadership and the superintendent for going back and trying to figure out, uh, I guess, a better way to kind of represent this goal in the interims. Uh, I think for me, a lot of my concern, I think, is best expressed through interim guardrail 1.2, increase the participation rate in surveys for the combined percentage of underrepresented groups. Um, from 13.6% uh, in January to 18.6% by June 2024, which it, it seems like a reasonable goal, I think, numerically, just kind of looking at it. But I, it just doesn't make sense to me why we don't care to have equitable representation of focal group populations in our survey. 
why we're unable to survey families of a rate higher than 20%, definitely understanding for a need to ramp up when we're looking at educational outcomes because of the needs to change that. But I don't actually understand why we can't make a commitment to these groups individually, why we can't make a group to these commitments that's equitable, and how can we expect for the results of these processes to reflect community if we aren't intentionally going out and ensuring that all community is participating. Um, but I, I, I think it just kind of reflects a to me, it reflects the fact that the perspective that the superintendent is taking does not necessarily reflect the expectations I had as a board member, nor does it reflect a willingness to engage with the majority of the families who've historically been harmed by the district. And I think looking at the definition of a major decision, Will it impact 25% of students and 25% of schools with no indication that we're looking at historically harmed communities, student groups that are historically left out? Like, in my mind, there are communities that we need to prioritize in engaging because we are actively failing them. And this misses all of that, which makes me feel that we are missing the mark as a district and that these do not represent a strong commitment. They, to me, represent an attempt at living up to the ideal, but don't reflect a passion or commitment to really ensuring that these voices are here and that these communities are center to our process. And I think that is a very big problem to me. And I hope board leadership and the superintendent will revise and correct these and really state in this guardrail and in the interims connected to it, what our commitment is to these families. Cause right now it doesn't seem like we have much of a real commitment to engaging them in ways that matter. Are there other comments from? Um, I'll just be brief. Um, I thank you to board leadership and working with the superintendent on this. Um, I do support um, what is being put forward today in recognition that yes, you know, shall we need to iterate um, over time, but I think this is an important um, a being at least to hone in more specifically than we have in the past. I do want to note around the community engagement strategy overall, and I, I appreciate what's been raised by colleagues. I think it's also conflated in two ways. One is as an organization or as the district you know, meaning under leadership, the superintendent, how's that community engagement strategy being developed in, um, for the organization? But there's also a board engagement. And so when we began on this process of the student outcomes governance work, um, it's actually upon the board. So if we, and the reason why maybe there's five people that came out to our board's initiated town halls is that we ourselves need to do deeper engagement. So, so I think that's my, but if that's, and I say, so at that, at this point, this is more, this is very directive to the superintendent. So um, I would all welcome if that was something that wanted to be initiated by board leadership to have that conversation at with the broader board um, and being really clear about what that is. Um, so I just wanted to at least, um, way in there. Yeah, I think, can I just build on that and, and ask maybe my colleagues a question? Because I think that's part of where I get a little bit stuck with this, where like if we're talking about an ad hoc committee or something, I feel like that makes sense if we're talking about board community engagement and producing some product for ourselves as a board. Be like, look, this is how we're going to do this. But if we make an ad hoc committee we can't design the superintendent's plan for community engagement. That's his job, right? And so I think that's where, like, there's so those that distinction I think is really important. And then I think the other thing um, it, that I just want to be honest that I think I've been struggling with personally through this whole thing is that I think what all of us want is a culture shift, right? We want the whole organization to be different on lots of different levels so that people feel like they can engage at different levels and don't have to come to the board of education. Um, as Commissioner Fisher said tonight, you know, obviously people came because they felt like they couldn't get their voice heard. They didn't feel heard in other spaces. Right. But we're also, that's not going to change overnight. And so I think part of the question also is like for us as a board, 
what is the most effective way of maintaining focus on that value and both supporting and holding the superintendent accountable to moving in that direction. So I just think that's the other piece is that like we may, we can say, oh yeah, we want it to be different. And I think a lot of people want it to be different, but it's the, the, the tools at our disposal really are to say to the superintendent, this is our expectation, right? So I think that's, I don't know. I don't know if people have thoughts on that. Okay. I, I would agree with that. I think, yeah, like what is the cultural shift in how we engage families? I think from a board member going out and engaging in public sessions, challenged by the majority of questions people have are for the superintendent and staff to answer. We don't have good communications with families to bring them together, right? So there's a challenge that we as individual board members, even as a board collective, I feel like we're struggling to address because there aren't structures in place to support us to do that work. I, mean, I think just to, to go back with my concern around the guardrail and the interims, just, I think to just really, I think, echo the concern, the way interim goal 1.2, and I think this is a reflection of kind of the approach to the whole thing, we could have zero African-American families complete the survey and meet that, right? And that would be acceptable. We could have zero Latino families meet that and reach that potentially, right? How how is that acceptable? Like, how does that reflect any of our values, right? I understand that the way the goals are structured limit the groups that we can include, so we have to have a single measure. But in doing that, we create a lot of invisibility, right? We just had a presentation from community groups about how that is not helpful for them and how they've done so much work to fix it. And so I think what I'm saying is that if we were going to have a real commitment, we need to have a real commitment. We need to show that commitment and not just in the guardrails, not just in the interims, but in the structure of the organization where we're making shifts that will allow us to do better and to have different outcomes. And I don't see that reflected in this or anywhere else in kind of the places where these things are being generated and created. And I think that is is really my concern. I hope other commissioners have that concern, and hopefully as this moves forward, we can see what the solutions are to that, unless we feel that it's okay that certain groups wouldn't necessarily be able to be seen or heard in this, knowing that the goal of this is that these groups are at the center and that these focal populations are seen, heard, and their voices are respected as we go through this. Let's go, Commissioner Fisher. And does anyone else want to comment before we close this? Yeah, you get to you get the last word. <laughs> no, it might not be the um, last word. Right. Okay. And I, I thank you for, uh, yes, I understand that my initial, my initial comments kind of conflated all my very convoluted comments into what sounded like one. There is a difference between district leadership's community engagement strategies and board's community engagement strategies. And we have not done a good job of defining them. So to take it back directly to and I think we could use an ad hoc committee to to really in a public and transparent way dive into this. I also think we're a member of the Council of Great City Schools. There's a lot of great practices from other districts that we could benchmark through an ad hoc committee like there's we don't have to reinvent the wheel here either. There's a lot of really good practices that that if we reached out to other folks who are doing this work are at our disposal. We've got coaches who do this in other districts, right? So I think there's a there's a lot at our disposal. Anyway, but looking at the guardrail, the superintendent will not make major major decisions without utilizing a process. I think for me, the disconnect between the guardrail and the in the interims is the fact that we name that there has to be a process in the guardrail. And then we do nothing in the interims to dig into what's the process. Like there's, for using the community engagement we're doing right now about around mergers, co-locations and closures, to the superintendent's point, we've had more than 10,000 touch points, right? Surveys, community meetings, everything. And that is not sustainable for every decision we make as a district, but what kind of process is what what is the sustainable process to engage families that's where i don't see anything in here that ties the the metrics the interims to the overall goal so that for me that's one example but i think like again we could maybe in the in the in the um the committee we could wordsmith this in a little bit more and to Thinking from the equity of it, also in one one point two, we don't mention sped anywhere. You know, I mean, there's a lot of other 
you know, if we're going to talk about equity, you know, and underrepresented populations, you know, and, and especially those who have been harmed, let's make sure we've got those voices in there too. All right, Superintendent Wayne, yeah. last word. Um, uh, might be a few words, but no, but uh, uh, um, no, a few thoughts. One is I really, I appreciate, I think you have honed in on the distinction between what the guardrail states and what you're asking for in terms of community engagement overall. Um, secondly, I'll let you all decide if you wanna have a committee, but I just wanna say, I fully agree with you. The committee should not be to then design what the districts work. What would be helpful is what is, is being more clear among yourselves, what is the expectation about what uh, uh, happens around community engagement and what that looks like? And really, if I, I'll push to say, have an honest conversation about what we're seeking and also giving an opportunity to really look at the data about where we are. So let me say what I mean by that. One is, I'm gonna put out Another reason why people come to the board, not just because they don't feel heard, but like you said, we have a culture. The culture is, huh, maybe if I go to the board, the board will then change the decision in the way that I want because I've gone to the board. And I'm not saying that that's there, and I understand that's happened in the past because sometimes the decision hasn't seemed to be uh, aligned with where the board wants to go, but we're really working on alignment. So I will say like, when you refer to some of the comments uh, that were shared tonight or at other board meetings, there have been many opportunities to engage. And just sometimes the answer is not going to be what people want, or there's not the trust there. So when we're talking about like the staffing, we we actually had a process that allowed for revisions to staffing. And I'm almost in some case, I'm, and just to be real, maybe at 10, you know, 1030 at night, it's like I'm, I'm actually frustrated that that the outcome is going to make it seem like because people came to the board, this is what the outcome was, when in fact we already had developed the process to make changes based on what we saw schools were needs and uh, schools were needing. So, you know, so I do, that's what would be really helpful is like, what are you looking, you know, what are you looking for? So again, like you said, the, the link line, I've shared some data with you, but you're right, it hasn't been a full board report, but you don't hear about link line because we get 18,000, like to date, we've gotten 18,000 inquiries on link line and 16,000 of them are resolved in one touch, right? And then, the, so what does resolve mean? And this, but so that's where like a committee conversation might be be good. And then the last thing is for the, um, for the interims, um, you know, so I'm hearing some, uh, I'm hearing some various conversations. I guess the one thing I'll say is we do want these to reflect our commitments, but just in terms of, what the guidelines are for um, for goals or for following the uh, process is they're supposed to be smart goals, right? And uh, the A is an attainable one. So that's where the balance is: is how do we demonstrate our commitment and our aspiration while also demonstrating um, that we're trying to make real progress? You know, so using again, these are just easier to use. But of course, I want more than. 48% of our Pacific Islander students at kindergarten to meet standards. You know, and I'm not gonna sit here in front of the Matua committee and say that that's gonna be okay, but it would not be attainable if we said, we're gonna go from 30% to 90% in one year. So I, I just put that out there to say like, this is something we struggle with, is, you know, is how do we balance being attainable while demonstrating our vision and, and, and commitment. But I hear the questions you're raising about how does 1.2 demonstrate that uh, that commitment. So we'll need to think about how we we uh, present that one. Could you just speak a little bit, just to build off what you just said? So then as far as 1.2 goes, then what, I guess, what is the reasoning behind those numbers and why can't they be higher or why can't they be equal to other groups that we'd be reaching with our kind of total outreach? Yeah, so in some way, I, um, well, this is where I want to go back and think, but I'll say like in some ways we even, uh, I'll say bent the rules a little with one uh, goal 1.1 because you're supposed to just have the, the one target, right? So this is saying, you know, looking at who are our underrepresented groups, we were looking at all the groups saying we want to reach all of them. But your point is well taken. Um, you know, you could then reach some of them and also not reach any of them. So this would need to think through if we separate it out, are we creating, you know, one, two, three, four, four separate goals, or is there a way to like make it one goal, kind of how we did with the the um 1.1? 1 
that's what we we need to think through. Is there anything we're get relating to the eighteen point six percent that is set there that that you could I guess add to kind of give just context on like that number and like what it represents? Yeah, I mean, for this, we I guess we are trying to find that balance of what would be attainable and what would be um, yeah, what what would be attainable. So we thought, and, and what's meaningful. So we thought a five percent increase would be meaningful. Okay, well, um, sounds like we're making progress, but there's more to be done as usual in this work. So thank you all, excuse me for that. Um, we're now gonna move on to item L, the consent calendar. Um, are there any items withdrawn or corrected by the superintendent? Sorry, um, I said that in the wrong order. Can I get a motion in a second? First, so moved. Second. Okay, now are there any items withdrawn or corrected by the superintendent? Superintendent? Dr. Wood. No. No. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, notes for myself. Great. So then we will have a roll call vote on the consent calendar, please. please. Commissioner Bogus? Yes. Commissioner Fisher? Yes. Commissioner Lamb? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. Commissioner Wiseman Ward? Yes. Vice President Alexander? Yes. Six eyes of pests. Thank you. All right, moving on to item M, um, the informational items. Um, so just, I, I don't know, if, do you have anything to say about the, the superintendent, Wayne? There's there's four, uh, excuse me, three informational items in item M, which are all initial proposals from uh, unions representing our employees. No, just uh, from a, as a process reminder, they, these are the sunshines. They actually have to come forward twice. So at the next board meeting, you accept them for action, and then there's that's the opportunity if, if anybody wants to speak to them. Thank you. Um, are there any, uh, so now moving on to item N, board members reports. Are there any reports um, from board members, either reports um, from delegates to membership organization or any other reports or appointments? Commissioner. Can we have sure. an updated list of appointments and openings and things like that? I'm I'm wondering if it would make sense for that to just be a, like a standing thing here of like, or maybe once a month we get a reminder of like, I'm sure I'm remiss in appointing to some committees, sure. but. Yeah. I could certainly prepare that. Yep. Okay. We have it, but I'll update it for you and get it out. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because some people roll off, you know, like. So or need to be reappointed and things like that. So yeah, just I don't know what I don't know what a regular basis is that we normally get that right. or should, but I mean, we could we could figure out a system to have it more regularly, maybe attached to that agenda item, so you can just always look at it. But yes, I'll get that to you right away. Okay. Any other reports or appointments? All right, that concludes item N, and that brings us to item O. At ten twenty seven p.m., this meeting is adjourned. Like Great job. There.